Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to King's. I'm Prabha Kotishwaran. I'm a professor of law uh, and social justice here at King's College London. And it's really nice to see you all. Uh, I think we have a really exciting lineup of speakers today uh, to address a very important issue around how to reduce uh, the vulnerability of uh, migrant women workers to forced labor uh, and human trafficking. So over the next couple of hours, we will have four panels with a range of uh, speakers. Uh, we are also hybrid, so we have colleagues uh, joining us from different parts of the world. And uh, we will have a sort of reception at the end of our uh, panel sessions today. So uh, I'm delighted to introduce the speakers on the first panel. Uh, we have Professor Dan Hunter, who's the Executive Dean of the Dixon Poon School of Law uh, here at King's. Uh, then we have Andrew Clayton, who is Senior uh, Social Development Advisor at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And finally, we have Philippe uh, Van Unigam, who is the Chief of uh, the Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work branch at the International Labour Organization. So I now hand over to, to Professor Hunter. Great. <clears throat> Good. Okay, this is actually working. Um, Thank you, Prabha. Um, so I'm Dan Hunter. I'm the Dean here at King's College London, and it falls to me to welcome you all um, to, to this event on, on forced labor. Um, so uh, my normal sort of pitch is to sort of say, okay, well, this is the environment that we're in, and, and let me tell you a little bit about King's and about the about the law school, and then hand over to the people who really matter. You know, mine is purely a ceremonial role. So, so we're here in in Bush House, which uh, is one of the the wonderful buildings that we are lucky enough to have here at King's. Uh, when when this building uh, was built, uh, or when it was finally commissioned in, in 1935, it was supposed to be, or supposed to be, um, the most expensive building in the wor world. Um, um, this room is actually quite nice, although it's a sort of a slightly awkward um, uh, um, uh, pillar in the in the middle of it. But we generally have, um, you know, sort of wonderful buildings that that suffer from the the usual kinds of issues that you have in London, which is you know never never quite the great sight lines, um, but look really wonderful from the outside with all the Portland stone. I actually wandered across from from Somerset House, which is which is literally a palace, um, uh, but is actually quite a, a, an interesting building in in, in which to work. Um, nonetheless, uh, for all that we have a sort of a, an interesting and, and varied kind of uh, campus environment, uh, King's is one of the great universities of the world. It was founded in 1929 um, uh, entirely as a, a response to religious intolerance, and, and that's one of the things which uh, we, we like to fight against, together with the sorts of social impact questions that you're going to be looking at today. Um, there are 14 Nobel laureates whom we've had on our, our faculties, none in law, alas, because there are no Nobel laureates uh, in law. We do um, have, for example, um, Florence Nightingale uh, was, uh, you know, the creator of, of modern nursing, uh, Joseph Lister. Uh, the creative aseptic uh, surgery, um, Peter Higgs, the um, uh, it wasn't actually the discoverer, he was the postulator of the Higgs boson, uh, amongst a range of other really remarkable uh, academics who have, have worked here, including Prabha and, and others, less, less so me, uh, more so her. So um, you, we're in a, a venerable and, and, and wonderful institution in research terms, and it's really my great privilege to welcome you here to um, push forward on the social impact component of the research that we do. It, research of itself is, is not valuable, but its effect upon society is, of course, one of the most uh, important components. Um, the presentation and, and panel today is on forced labour, as you'd all be aware of, focusing on what works and what doesn't uh, in addressing unfree labour in migrant, work, uh, migrant women workers' destinations. Uh, since 2012, the International Labour Organization, with the support of the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Domestic uh, Development Office, has implemented a flagship program to test innovative ways to tackle forced labour and human trafficking. Following 10 years of implementation, the program has documented a rich set of lessons learned that can help guide future efforts to tackle similar challenges. So today, you'll hear a presentation and uh, of these findings together with panel discussions uh, from other leaders in the field. And obviously, I refer to um, the uh, agenda so that you can see all of the people who are going to be talking today. But the first person who is going to be talking today, substantively, uh, apart from uh, this welcome of mine, is Andrew Clayton. And I hand over to him um, to give you the first of what will, I'm sure, be a, a rich set of presentations and discussions around an incredibly important topic. Um, thank you all for being here today. And uh, my apologies, I have to rush off for yet another uh, opening. Thank you very much. Over okay. to you, Andrew. 
phase this um, thank you, Dan. Um, yes, yeah, so no, and also a big thanks to King's College London for hosting the event today, and we're very grateful for, for this. Um, we've had um, a number of meetings in FCDO this morning. We had a FCDO wide uh, seminar on on the lessons and the work in freedom, but it's really great opportunity now to go into more depth and 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 have a you know meet with sort of external sort of stakeholders, policymakers, and academics to discuss the work of working freedom. Um, just say this has been a unique 10 year partnership between uh, ILO and FCDO. Um, it's our longest running and one of the largest programs under the modern slavery theme uh, across UK government. Um, I think just a few brief reflections for me at the start before handing over to Philippe and then we'll get into the substantive discussions is that I think one of the things I've been involved in working freedom for about the last six years uh, and colleagues here have been for, for longer is I think one of the great strengths of the programme is it the way it's adapted and evolved over the years, both in relation to the evidence and learning that has been generated within the programme, but also in adapting to the changing context. And I think we particularly saw that in relation to COVID when, um, you know, ILA had to sort of repurpose a lot of the activities uh, to support migrant workers who, who'd lost jobs uh, through the various lockdowns or had to return to their, their communities. So. I think that adaptability of the program has been really important. And I mean, a good example of this is when, when the program started, I think there was a very big focus on working in uh, source communities on sort of pre-departure training. Um, I think as the, as, as the, the program learned and sort of built the evidence base, recognize that that was still important, but we needed to take a much broader look at how do we protect women from, from trafficking and forced labor. So phase two of the program, which uh, so we had we funded first phase from 20 phase one from 2013 to 2018. And then we're in the second phase now, which comes to an end next month uh, from 2018 to 2023. So the, the second phase has, has worked on five areas. So it's worked continued to work in, in source communities. Uh, it's also looked a lot at labor intermediaries, particularly looking at recruitment to look at those sort of recruitment pathways from South Asia to the Middle East. Uh, done increasing amount of work in destination countries, including working with worker centers in, in Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, also a much more focus on advocacy to try and influence government policy around uh, trafficking, forced labor and decent work. And then uh, continue to be a, a large investment in research and evidence. Um, both within ILO, but also I wanted to note uh, we, through some additional FCDO funding that IFPRI, which is the International Food Policy and Research Institute, has done a, a study through, um, we have a, something called the Centre for Excellence and Development uh, Impact and Learning, another acronym, um, around looking at how tr what, what works best in reducing the vulnerability of women to trafficking. So that work is also ongoing and hope, we hope that will be published soon. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, Really, I mean, I think just final for me, I think it has been a very, as I said, it's been a unique partnership, I think very productive partnership with ILO. I think we've been very impressed by the, the expertise, the commitment uh, and uh, energy of ILO, both at a country, regional and at headquarters level. Um, and also finally would like to, to thank the, um, the advisory group. So we have here Prabhya, Mike and Samita. Um, there are others who have been in the advisory group over the years, and I think they've been an invaluable role in providing that independent expertise and advice to guide FCDO and ILO in terms of the delivery of the program. So thanks to all, and I will hand over to Philippe from ILO. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, uh, for these opening remarks. It's my turn to thank you and thank the government of Great Britain and FCDO in particular for this trust in the organization and also the King's College to receive us and all the inputs you have go to this partnership. Um, as Professor Dan start with a bit of history, <laughs> let me also remind why we are here working on, on forced labor and trafficking issues. Um, and as I'm coming from the ILO, um, from the inset of what the ILO is uh, back in 1919, so over a century. The, um, that was in times of crisis, just after the First World War. 
and in the um, Treaty of Versailles, who create basically the foundation for the RLO, it was, and I read, lasting peace can only be established based on social justice. And that's the core value, I think, that this partnership is trying to push. Um, that was reaffirmed by the Declaration of Philadelphia after the Second World War. If I make reference to it, it's basically because the vision of this international organization is quite unique, at least on two elements. First, that public policy to promote social justice is not coming only from government. It's also coming from the world of work stakeholders, from employers, from workers that sit at the table at the international level and in country to shape the future of the world of work. And it starts basically by basic rights. And that was enacted in a declaration, an, another declaration that is put in practice very concretely, which is the Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights of Work 25 years ago in 1998 and amended in 2022, where it lays the foundation of what are the basic principles and rights that should be implemented, whether you are part of the, the, um, the organization or whether you, you have or not ratified its core convention. And that's very important. Um, and the principle that has been, or the right, the basic right, fundamental right that has been adopted at the international level, implemented through the convention, are five of its kind. One of them is clearly the abolition of forced labor, along with the elimination of child labor, the uh, elimination of any form of discrimination in the world of work, um, the right to organize and to bargain collectively, so important in society in search of social justice. And recently, the adoption last year and during the International Labour Conference of the fifth pillar, which is um, safety and, and uh, self safe and healthy environment uh, for work. If I mention that, it's because the recognition of fundamental rights put in practice has been done through this type of partnership, through the, the work in freedom, uh, program and it's manifested through the operational uh, or the, the operation of what the norms what the standard are saying and in particular the convention 29 which was adopted by the international labor conference in 1930 so quite early in in the uh, in the life of, of the organization and reaffirmed by the protocol in 2014 so the work in freedom program uh, along with other technical cooperation program is an instrument to help our constituents, so the workers, employers, and government in countries to put legislation in place based on those international standards and practices along with. So the, the last introductory work I want to, to mention before we go in the substance is that a lot has been achieved in this last century in terms of fighting child labor, forced labor, other forms of discrimination. Nevertheless, given the recurrent crisis that we live today with the COVID, it was very clear uh, with the U Ukraine crisis or more national crisis linked to war or environmental issue, we see a backfire of those rights in very practical terms. The last global estimate that the ILO produced uh, last year on forced labor shows that there is an increase by almost 3 million, uh, coming from 24 million people in forced labor to 27 million last year, due partly, but not exclusively, to uh, the crisis in COVID, but partly only. So the message here is that there is a sense of urgency, urgency to apply and to come back to a path of implementing in practice um, fundamental rights, and in particular, abolition of forced labor. So what we will discuss today is indeed what kind of lessons can be drawn from this practical program, what has worked and not worked, in particular for uh, categories of, of people which are women in uh, 
and migrant uh, women in particular. And we will discuss the type of approach that has been implemented in the past and what type of approach um, makes a difference uh, in nowadays. Putting at the center, and you will see in our intervention, uh, putting at the center the instrument of the world of work. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to the first panel, which will be chaired by Professor Chalika Jusha. Hi. It is a great pleasure to be here today to in a way, complete a journey of many years with this program. Um, I invite Mike to help me chair this session. Um, Igor and Neha are the main speakers and Alejandra and Natalie will be the discussants. So if everyone comes to the panel, Igor is already there. So those who may not know, Igor is the chief technical advisor of the program Work in Freedom, uh, which translated into English probably means leading spirit of the program. Um, and Neha is the, the national program coordinator. She's looked after the India part of the program and has also been one of the more sort of feisty leaders of the program. So we have two um, major uh, figures in this program with us today to tell us a little bit about, so the first session is going to be about uh, migrant women in their destination workplaces. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, before we go into the destination side about what this is about. Um, we have over the past 10 years documented a series of uh, lessons. Um, and uh, the whole idea is uh, to to basically make sure, as Andrew mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago, that we're actually learning around the process and what we're not just implementing what uh, what uh, we think is uh, the the Bible. <laughs> so um, we'll be basically looking at the destination side, and then I'll be looking into uh, countries of origin, uh, where my colleague Neha will be presenting, and then I'll. Um, uh, come back uh, for the recruitment and the way forward. Um, so this is the next one. So all the uh, all these pictures are basically from the Work in Freedom program with the people we've worked with. Um, and uh, uh, so I will won't say very much about the program. I think also that uh, Andrew has mentioned all the five pillars of the work the work in the countries of origin, how we reach out to women, particularly in communities where they actually migrate from and uh, try to uh, provide information and uh, about uh, the migration uh, in, uh, in the countries where they go to, but also about local employment opportunities and other uh, matters. Um, there is the, old, the side of outreach in uh, countries of destination uh, through worker centers and trade unions and uh, and also through employers, uh, uh, basically uh, building dialogue on how to uh, improve the working conditions in particularly in sectors like domestic work and in garment work. Um, and uh, then we have a, a, a whole focus on recruitment. And so the whole process of labor intermediation and um, then the forces of the whole policy and uh, uh, legislation side. Uh, and finally, uh, research. Um, uh, so the program has particularly been focusing on so mobility of women between in South Asia and in West Asia, uh, particularly in India. So in India, uh, uh, internally, women migrating from, for instance, uh, uh, the Chotanagpur uh, Plateau, which is mostly uh, uh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Orissa, uh, moving to the big cities of, uh, of India, in Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, uh, Chennai, and others, uh, to work in domestic work or in garment work, but also looking at the uh, 
the migra international migration that happens from um, places like um, South India, uh, particularly uh, Andhra Pradesh, going, say, to Kuwait or to uh, UAE and other um, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, but also from Bangladesh uh, to uh, the Middle East, as well as Nepal to the Middle East. So it's a very wide uh, um, geographical span, um, but uh, nevertheless fascinating to work with because uh, there are a lot of uh, some differences, but also a lot of similarities between uh, the types of challenges that uh, women face in migrating, whether it's internally or um, internationally. So um, all these lessons that we have documented are, have been, there's been several editions of this uh, that we have published over the past years. And uh, they basically uh, follow a certain pattern, which is uh, to basically uh, identify how it was, um, uh, how the lesson was learned and uh, what are some of the practical lessons for future policy and programming. Um, so here I go into the destination side. Um, so just before going explaining what we do, I think it's very important, uh, following a little bit about what um, uh, Philippe, my colleague, was just saying uh, concerning the, the context of the normative context, it's important to highlight that in terms of addressing forced labor in destination countries, there is a, a history on which uh, uh, we're trying to build on. Um, there is a whole um, set of um, attempts to focus, for instance, on extinguishing debts, uh, uh, particularly related to bonded labor that dates back from antiquity when uh, you have had uh, different types of, uh, uh, of um, edicts to basically uh, release uh, workers, uh, uh, people from, uh, from debts. And that's so it dates from, from quite a while ago, but you also have more modern examples of how that can work through, uh, for instance, um, uh, the abolition of bonded labor in, in a country like India. Uh, but there's also this whole trend of uh, abolishing slavery, which has influenced the, the normative process and the thinking around what works, uh, particularly with the 1926 Slavery Convention and the 1956 so Supplementary Slavery Convention. And then you have the, uh, the what Philippe mentioned about uh, the eradication of forced labor in our Convention 29 and the abolition of forced labor in Convention uh, 105. And, and finally, uh, the protocol on forced labor that was adopted in 2014. And, and so, and then there's a whole other, other set of uh, thinking which has emerged from the anti-trafficking, uh, more of a criminal justice framework, which um, uh, started particularly around 2000 with the, uh, uh, the Palermo Protocol uh, to the um, uh, Convention on or or uh, Organized Crime. Um, so, uh, but of course, there's many forms of unfree labor that remain to be uh, addressed, such as women's unpaid work, un unrecognized informal work, work involving poverty wages, and and others. So, there's there's still working progress. Uh, sure. Um, so, there's a few types of conventional approaches that are usually used to addressing. Uh, um, forced labor uh, nowadays in the world of UN programming, international organizations. And uh, one of those particular ways is to focus on what is called the four Ps, the prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnerships. It's, uh, it's largely inspired on also some of the uh, conventions uh, that I've mentioned, um, but that's sort of more the, the conventional approach. There's also, of course, the responses related to our uh, forced labor framework, uh, which uh, focus on addressing particularly the notion of coercion in the world of work. Um, and uh, what we did in the Work and Freedom program is we tested some uh, program, some types of interventions which, which went a little beyond uh, these uh, uh, conventional approaches, including, of course, trying to test and uh, learn from the, the successes and failures uh, in responding uh, to forced labor, uh, but also trying to actually look at the uh, and identifying and addressing the root causes of forced labor. Uh, it's easier said, of course, than done. We do not claim that we have 
achieve this and we'll go much more in details about this but it's a it is an important consideration to keep in mind because many times uh the different uh, stakeholders that are trying activists that are focusing on forced labor they're very enthusiastic about a few uh types of interventions that they're doing but uh unable to change the uh, the macro picture, which is very important to address uh, through different types of policies. And uh, then we have, um, of course, a, a very important part, which is people who are in forced labor are often in asymmetrical labor relationships, and it's important for them to be able to have some sort of a support base on which through which their voice can be amplified. So here we go into uh, different uh, specific lessons on the in destination countries uh, where the working relationships are. I'm st we're starting this discussion around the destination areas because that's where the world of work primarily is. So that's where people deal with wages, with work time, with uh, uh, leave and, um, and uh, occupational safety and health issues and so on. So it's very important uh, to start from that. And so the first set of lessons is really around the... Um, relationship between job markets and forced labor, which is something we usually do not think about. Um, and I'll explain a little bit why. So the first lesson is that the scarcity of decent jobs and the absence of social protection are factors of market coercion for job seekers. And this affects their vulnerability to forced labor. Combined, they are important aggregate indicators of forced labor risks. Um, why the reason we're we're saying this is that we've noticed particularly in the case of south asia that when you have a significant uh, um, lack of jobs uh, then people are desperate basically to find and accept whatever is available and often uh, those are very abusive working relationships and so if this whole issue of scale of employment and decent work are not addressed then you have a direct relationship with uh, with the uh, prevalence of uh, forced labor. And therefore, uh, this is something which usually escapes and is not mentioned in most of the programs uh, that uh, we, um, that, that focus on addressing and trafficking and forced labor. Uh, the second point is that in the context of migration, anti-trafficking and forced labor programs should not delink the analysis of labor abuses uh, that take place in migrant destination areas from employment options and decent work ups in areas of origin. Because basically, uh, if there is a scarcity of work in the countries of origin, uh, it ex their expe the expectations of workers of what they can find and accept um, are determined uh, by their home country's uh, context. And when they migrate and travel, uh, to, for instance, countries in the Middle East or to other states in, in, um, in, in say, in India, uh, they have uh, their their expectations basically also start framing the uh, the minimum uh, type of uh, working conditions that employers are uh, trying to promote to basically save costs. So I think it's important to uh, take advantage of the anti-trafficking framework that links countries of origin and destination uh, to be able uh, to understand these uh, root factors. The second set of lessons are basically around the shifting power dynamics in labor relationships. And uh, um, uh, so here is that recognizing how different forms of discrimination are perpetrated against migrant workers is critical for better anti-trafficking and forced labor interventions. Uh, such discrimination is a root cause of forced labor. We have a publication which is sitting outside on basically the structural roots of forced labor. And we, I think we have uh, a, a few of the authors who uh, were who there, uh, 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 Professor Jens Lerche here from SOAS, and uh, we have Neha who was with us and myself, who basic and, and uh, uh, Alessandra, and we have basically who have been working on that, uh, who work on that report, but basically showing that there is, there are hierarchies uh, uh, and exclusions in the world of work in different countries that are uh, enshrined in the law of the land uh, that basically determine whether, uh, for instance, domestic workers can, can um, have the regular types of protections or not. And usually those exclusions are there and therefore it's very important to address 
those uh, that type of discrimination if one wants to basically um, um, uh, start uh, having an impact on uh, abolishing forced labor. Uh, the next point, which is quite uh, interesting, is that, that while international cooperation to leverage commitments to er eradicate forced labor is important, practical cooperation in locations where workers' voices are marginalized and, and is lacking is yet crucial in the prevention of forced labor. In areas and sectors where forced labor is common, a worker raising questions about labor issues can lead to her immediate ev eviction from the workforce and the asymmetrical nature of uh, the labor relationships is such that workers have few or no safe uh, avenues to voice complaints or issue concerns. And cooperation um, to establish practical and effective remedy mechanisms is very important. So uh, uh, this is, uh, for, in for instance, when we talk about Alliance 8.7, which is this global alliance uh, of different um, stakeholders interested in uh, making a difference on modern slavery, it is important to have this uh, sort of practical cooperation on the ground that would allow us to bring remedies to workers who are in situations uh, of abusive working conditions. Uh, another point which is very important is alone, neither NGOs, trade unions, nor women rights groups can expect to successfully empower women. It's, uh, it, this is, it's, it's, it's very important, but we have, it sounds very, um, uh, very uh, evident, but actually it's, uh, we've witnessed this in the ground through different types of partnerships. When uh, trade unions were actually collaborating with women rights groups, and with uh, these academics and others, and there is unity, there's much more um, leverage that can be uh, applied on government officials who then basically um, have no choice but to actually take decisions in, in that direction. Um, the, the next point is the social dialogue between employers and migrant workers in a context of domination can be disadvantageous for migrant workers and leads at best to concession bargaining. Uh, negotiations from a position of weakness is never advisable as it can result in migrant workers surrendering their rights to fair pay and working conditions in exchange for some form of job security, partial compensation, or exit from coercive labor relationships. Uh, this doesn't mean that social dialogue is not important. Social dialogue is very important, but it's important uh, that it, it's basically conducted uh, when uh, migrant workers and women workers are ready to be able to uh, negotiate. Otherwise, it can lead to um, a further, uh, further retaliation, as I mentioned. Uh, next point is that gender based violence and harassment is closely connected uh, with uh, uh, gendered and social structures and employment hierarchies. Uh, the gender and social, so for instance, with, when we're talking about the the factory floors, um, there, it's very gendered. You have uh, basically the machine operators um, who are usually women and the supervisors who are men. So they uh, re recreate a structure uh, based on the traditional uh, patriarchal uh, systems and that allows uh, the persistence of basically different types of abusive uh, um, working conditions, including harassment. The uh, next point is that uh, without freedom of association and collective bargaining for migrant workers, reducing their vulnerability to forced labor is unsustainable. Um, so organizing, of course, it's, it's very important that uh, w workers have uh, ca can be heard. And when their voice is not uh, legally acknowledged because of lack of representation, uh, for instance, in the Middle East, we have several there's a lot of unions uh, there, but uh, migrant workers are often uh, cannot elect their own, uh, cannot be elected as union leaders and have their voice represented. And so uh, it creates, uh, you know, basically it's very difficult to acknowledge that they have issues. And so situations of abusive labor uh, persist in such contexts. You have, um, I'll, I'll skip this because I think we have. Um, uh, so the next point is that common anti-trafficking policy frameworks can sometimes concurrently undermine hard-won labor um, and other human rights, such as the right to work and freedom of movement, or even efforts to promote decent work. The reason we're saying this is because we have seen through almost more than 20 years of conventional anti-trafficking um, 
efforts, uh, which are no doubt very important, but they have often focused on, um, for instance, the whole migration side and less on the world of work. And as a result of that, uh, a lot of these types of uh, interventions have criminalized uh, recruiters. And while there are good and bad recruiters, uh, recruiters play a very important role in basically uh, uh, making employment possible. Uh, while migration may be profitable for employers who hire migrant workers because they are more affordable and amenable than local workers, such practices can generate labor market loopholes that erode decent work practices, employment prospects for local workers. Uh, this is very important. We have a policy brief which is uh, there, but uh, migrant workers should not be blamed for taking the jobs of local workers. It's the practice of hiring uh, migrant workers into substandard working conditions that is to blame, and that's usually uh, the the employers who who would normally engage in that type of work. So, um, I'm getting to the end here, so I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, migrant sh migration uh, bans increase vulnerability to human uh, trafficking. Uh, we've seen uh, migration bans, particularly in Nepal and Bangladesh and India, in different forms and shapes, uh, whether it's based on the age uh, or not, and we've basically documented and done research showing that these uh, types of bans actually create more uh, precarious routes because women in the end are looking for employment and whether uh, there are obstacles or not, they will find ways of, of migrating when there is supply and demand. And uh, as a result of these types of bans, uh, it creates gr additional vulnerabilities which are there. And this is not just related to uh, mobility uh, in terms of migration. It's also related to different occupational sectors. There are, there are also occupational sectors like sex work where uh, when, when you do have uh, different types of uh, prohibitions and um, when you know there are prohibitions, you do have all sorts of other vulnerabilities that rise in the world of work. Um, the notion that migrant workers can be easily reintegrated into their home communities through ad hoc crisis related reintegration programs runs against the labor market realities that prompted them to migrate in the first place. Very important to mention that in South Asia, the, there is a process of structural transformation of uh, shifting from a, a, an economy that is based in on uh, basically agriculture to uh, to uh, industries and services, but the industries and services uh, and even agriculture are not basically providing sufficient jobs. So it means that you have a lot of surplus labor that that is there and people need to migrate. And the an idea that people can be reintegrated in a, when you have a, a structural setting in which the economy is basically has surplus labor is erroneous. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Um, I think um, I'll leave it there. Uh, just to say that we have document also some, oh, sorry. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just saying. Uh, some, we have some assumptions that we have documented and some of the better practices that we have also put here. Um, uh, I won't go through them uh, because, but we can have a discussion when we go into the, uh, uh, the we, we can talk about them when we go into the discussion. All right, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Prabha. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Shamita. Uh, and thank you, colleagues from the FCDO uh, for the opportunity to work on this program uh, and be here to present some of the lessons that we've learned. I'm going to focus on areas and countries of origin. Um, and straight away, uh, in the interest of time, just outline, I think, some of the frameworks uh, that that we use um, at the ILO, but also in in the context, broader context of looking at trafficking, um, there is of course Article Nine of the Palermo Protocol, which focuses on prevention, and we see that a lot of uh, policies and laws around trafficking actually do not focus on prevention. Um, there's also the Global Compact of Migration, uh, which I think is very relevant to the work that we do. Um, so these are some of the conventional safe migration programs in states and countries of origin. There's the free departure orientation, uh, commonly known as the PDOT, uh, which we can see across South Asia. Then there are also resource facilitation centers, uh, which are established you know, uh, for migrants to be able to access information about 
uh, their journeys. But what I'd like to sort of draw your attention to is the fact that while we looked at pre pre departure orientation training programs, we uh, through the course of the program understood that pre decision orientation training uh, is actually more effective because it looks at the behavior of aspiring migrant women, but exposes them to information that can prepare them for for the migration journey uh, before they migrate. We also undertook capacity building of social workers and local women leaders, um, and 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 not just government officials um, at, at senior levels, but also in, in the case of India, for example, scheme workers or Anganwadi workers that actually interact with a lot of these potentially migrant workers um, on a more regular basis. Uh, I'm going to jump straight into the lessons now. Um, and as Igor mentioned, we've tried to sort of compartmentalize or, or um, you know, put together some of the lessons under various themes. So the first set of lessons is on uh, migratory trends. Um, migration of women depends on the specific context of patriarchy and how women's mobility, work seeking and distress is socially appraised and mediated. The more women's mobility for paid work is restricted and socially stigmatized, the more women will simply not migrate or if they are desperate to leave, migrate suddenly and secretly to avoid stigma. For all those who have never migrated, migrating all of a sudden can be risky, even if staying back is equally undesirable. And I'd like to just spend a moment to talk about how so many young women workers uh, that we, we met across the program uh, aspired for a better future. But they did mention the fact that there was interfamily decision making, in, uh, you know, which led to male preference being practiced in, 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 in various situations. And therefore, you know, opportunities to study or work were very limited. We also had several women migrant workers reporting how they faced violence within their homes or social stigma and lack of employment opportunities uh, due to their marital status. So for example, being separated, widowed, abandoned or divorced actually spurred decisions to migrate uh, and search for a, and, and search for decent work. The next lesson is um, I think a very interesting and an important one, which is the cost of blue collar international migration for women tends to be lower than that of men in the region. Um, and over the course of the 10 year program period, uh, we've actually seen uh, women reporting lesser and lesser costs of migration, right? Now this, this could be in part due to increased awareness about the demand that exists in the destination. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's primarily because of the high demand, uh, which then converts into, um, you know, very large numbers of, of women being sourced from, from specific pockets within uh, sending areas uh, in, into, you know, these sectors, especially in, in terms of care work, domestic work um, that we saw. So in a sense, I mean, this is, this is also a situation where we see employers willing to pay up front uh, you know, uh, to hire these workers. And, and on, you know, on the surface of it, while this might be a great idea, right, that employers are willing to pay upfront, what we've also seen is that this can actually result in lesser freedom to exit forced labor conditions for women. So longer probation periods, um, you know, more, longer lock-in periods for women to be able to, for employers to be able to recover the costs uh, that they have actually invested in. The next lesson uh, is on my, the fact that migration through formal channels and or migration into formal work does not guarantee protection from labor abuses. So while migrating through informal channels involves risks, uh, legal channels in, into formal work situations can also lead into abusive labor situations. So we have, for example, sponsorship systems like the kafala uh, which bestow on employers overwhelming power to expose a migrant worker to criminal proceedings. So we've seen that, you know, when labor abuses are reported by migrant workers, they are met by a counter uh, uh, complaint, you know, of, of theft that a lot of employers uh, use to sort of offset uh, what, what could then ensue. And we can see that while lawsuits on labor abuses rarely come to a conclusion, even if a decision is made, it is rarely in favor of migrant workers. Um, we've seen that formal wages of migrant workers are often legally set below uh, wages of local workers, right? So entering formal labor relationships, hence, does not necessarily protect a migrant worker from abuse. 
if decent working conditions and labor inspection and administration is not worker friendly, um, we cannot really see any guarantee against labor abuses in the workplace. The next set of lessons um, are drawing upon political economy considerations uh, as we look at uh, areas of origin. Now we have public narratives that claim that pre-departure policies and programs are needed to protect migrant workers. But in reality, we see that migrant workers' interests tend to be crowded out of these institutional programs by other competing and more powerful interests. So we see that you know, in, in countries such as Nepal and Bangladesh, as well as in India, um, the, well, pockets in India, we can see that there are outbound employment regimes which operate, right? Because we can, we can see a transition from rural economies um, to, to a more globalized economy, which is in full swing. We've seen traditional occupations, um, you know, give way to um, sort of more uh, capital intensive monoculture of, you know, agriculture, where fewer people are employed. So you actually have, even in rural areas, lesser jobs available. So in, an, in the absence of, you know, jobs in rural areas, um, and unless new jobs are created by industries and agricultural practices, you know, it's 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 very difficult to actually see how one can replace old livelihoods in 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 the rural context. So we see then in you know with agrarian distress, as as has been um, reported widely uh, through you know a variety of studies as well as in our own experience uh, through the actors that we worked with, we can see that actually there's there's a situation where uh, you have local actors then colluding with with um, you know with employers and destinations to then source these workers out of some of these areas and some of these areas that we worked in especially for example in urissa these are actually extremely resource rich areas so this is also a way of moving the local population out uh, so that there would be lesser dissent in terms of you know the the policies that have been um, sort of put in place really uh, to help um, you know, extraction as well as capitalist development in that context. So in, in such a context, you see pre-departure trainings, uh, mostly, uh, you know, teaching lessons on docility, on, on how workers need to actually be compliant uh, with what the employer's expectations are, et cetera. And, and we can see clearly that there is little, if any, space for migrant workers to really voice their views and learn about negotiation and organizing practices to defend their labor and human rights. The next lesson uh, is on safe migration interventions and how they tend to be ineffective in preventing violation of women's rights. While safe migration programs can be helpful in patriarchal contexts, the concept of safety and protection actually tends to exclude women's agency. So protection measures for women tend to be designed without the leadership and participation of migrating women um, and their representatives. This inevitably leads to policies and practices that disempower them from the exercise of their rights. For example, you have in India, you know, a restriction based on, uh, on, on mobility based on age. So if you're under the age of 30, uh, you're not allowed to migrate. So instead of the instead of the the apparatus, the state apparatus and local you know community partners actually working to empower these women to migrate uh, and select better options, we see actually quite the opposite. The next set of lessons is on uh, the relationship between development actors and migrant women, and I'm just going to focus on one lesson in the interest of time here, which is that migration and anti-trafficking programs. Uh, really need to be aware of the social distance that separates women migrant workers and those who decide and implement such programs at various levels. Because the economic and social reality is determining the lives of these migrant women workers and those who decide and implement migration or anti-trafficking programs actually are very different. Uh, and in this situation, the role of trade unions and community-based organizations is really important to underline. I'll give you an example quickly from, the, from you know, what we see in India that there's a huge divide in terms of, um, you know, what the caste location of government officials is, right? Uh, and if you look at actually migrant women and the communities they belong to, um, so it's very, it's very actually difficult for these government officials to really imagine 
uh, what what the lived realities of of women coming from these marginalized communities are. So even if they are well intentioned, uh, a lot of these programs and policies actually backfire uh, because they don't take into consideration women's voices. So it's absolutely essential to have uh, trade unions and and women's collectives actually representing what women workers want to do uh, and and how policies can be made more effective for them. The next lesson uh, is that pre-departure skilling is more effective when women workers organizations are involved. So we talked about pre-departure, but even in, in the case of skilling, we can see that institutions tend to prioritize foreign employment over other considerations. And this is, I think, more in the case of Bangladesh that we are drawing this lesson from. Realistic discussions on real working and living conditions of workers or the involvement of work, workers' organizations is very limited. And this would undermine the very incentives under which um, they operate. So we looked at a lot of pre-departure skilling processes and we saw that the content of the training really omitted information on working conditions abroad. Um, and they tend to portray a rosy picture about possible earnings. Um, so if, if we look at skilling institutions and the need to justify their funding uh, by meeting targets of the number of people you know, that they have trained and employed, uh, we again see that even recruitment agencies, you know, are in collusion with these training institutes to then omit this information, which would be critical to workers uh, who would want to decide whether they should migrate or not. So as a result, the program suggested that agencies involved uh, with migrant worker organizations should actually take a lead in training as well uh, and try to ensure that a more realistic picture of working conditions can be provided so an informed choice can actually be made by workers. The next set of lessons uh, is on um, you know, what we've learned through our village or neighborhood level outreach. And we can say that conventional safe migration interventions tend to either prevent migration or promote it. And actually both can be harmful. Uh, from both a policy and, pol uh, and program perspective, it is important to neither stop women from migrating nor encourage them to. Um, Two opposing patterns tend to prevail, and we can see that the mainstream conservative approach is that anti-trafficking NGOs, the conventional um, variety, do um, you know inflate the risks of in uh, of trafficking, and and they actually fail to see that women need jobs to make ends meet. The more liberal approach, on the other hand, was represented by some migrant rights NGOs who exaggerated the benefits of migration and minimize its risks. So we feel that both actually can, can be uh, problematic. Okay, um, now I'm just trying to see since I've already been see, got the yellow card. Um, I have two more lessons. Um, and so the second last lesson is going to be that in order to better reach women who may migrate, the context of the information shared with them should not exclusively focus on migration. And I think this again was very interesting because we saw that prospective migrants are usually those who cannot access basic services in their communities. Uh, they cannot access basic jobs um, in, in the areas that they come from. So intensive two-way communication is necessary with these populations who are usually excluded or unable to access basic services even within their communities. They need to be able to explain the local circumstances of why they are unable to access these services and participate in strategizing effective local solutions to overcome such barriers. So in, in a lot of the interaction and trainings that we did, we tried to talk about financial literacy. We tried to talk about other areas which might be of interest to women workers and not just focus on you know, the risks and benefits of migration because it's really the entire ecosystem which is important to consider and see if women can access jobs locally. And we did see in many cases that women actually, local women, I mean, groups were created and they would go and lobby with the local authorities to actually ask for uh, you know allocation of more work under public employment schemes um, and the like, right? So it's very important to really listen to what women want uh, rather than having this um, you know uh, singular approach um, to educating them about the risks and benefits. And the last lesson that I will share and then stop is 
that the assumptions behind programs seeking to inform or empower migrant women in areas from which they migrate should really be carefully reviewed. Because the program found that conventional interventions tend to assume that women have limited knowledge and skills, and they face a significant risk, therefore, of human trafficking. This is often not true. So if we look at the case of care work or domestic work, can we really say that it doesn't require any skills? And we know that you know, um, in more recent studies and discussions now, the value of this work um, and the importance of this work has been really underlined. So in the context of women who migrate into these low-income jobs, I think it's important to highlight how skilled their work is. Uh, and, and I think this would really help in being able to position them uh, in, in, in a better situa situation to bargain for their rights um, and, and for access to decent work. I'll stop there, thank you. So first of all, I will start um, by saying <clears throat> uh, thank you to Traba and to Neha and Igor and the ILO for inviting me. It's, um, it's an honor it's, uh, uh, to get to discuss uh, uh, the final lessons from uh, the um, from the program. It's also great to see <laughs> some of the people that I've been working with um, with reference to garments in the last years, because of course uh, we have done work that uh, it was primarily remote due to the, the pandemic, so it was great uh, to, to see you uh, in person. Well, of course I have very little time, so I have to pick and choose what I'm about to say in relation to some of the lessons that for me, as someone that's been working with garment workers for, for a long time, mean. And uh, so I'll probably um, pick a theme on the destination and one uh, particularly on the outreach before raising uh, uh, a couple of general points. Um, on starting with the destination and through um, a lens based on uh, evidence from garments, I think uh, a key point that the lessons you learned phrase and that was touched upon in Igor's uh, uh, presentation was uh, um, how this distinction we generally make between formal and informal migration as if one was more abusive than others being entirely false. Actually, through the experience of garment workers, one could say if we sort of put the contractors at the very center of, of uh, 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 this uh, movement, uh, how in fact the two uh, reinforce uh, each other. Nevertheless, I have to say that uh, um, the experience of women workers um, uh, uh, that end up uh, in uh, 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 through patterns of formal migration, or at least they land uh, in a formal space, uh, particularly in areas like uh, Bengaluru, that is uh, increasingly working through the rise of uh, dormitories uh, of the kinds that we have seen in other parts uh, of. Uh, um, Southeast Asia, for instance, uh, it just raised new question in relation of how new forms of labor and freedom uh, uh, sort of uh, is created uh, in uh, uh, destination areas. And this actually is an issue that works both for garment workers that circulate internally, as well as for women workers that instead will just circulate uh, um, externally. So, you know, evidence from India, for instance, uh, uh, women migrating from uh, uh, the northern eastern regions uh, ending up in uh, Bengaluru uh, suggests that the dormitories is becoming a logistics uh, device through which new forms of uh, uh, um, unfreedom uh, uh, is created. And also it's uh, a, a way whereby we see the trickling in of debt into uh, uh, industrial relations, while instead generally with reference to India, debt is uh, more uh, discussed with reference to uh, the um, to the informal economy. So I guess my, the questions that I have here is uh, to what extent we can think of interventions uh, that start specifically targeting uh, uh, not just destination uh, areas for workers, uh, but living areas for workers at destination. So mm -hmm. the like, well, and of course, I'm making reference to the dorms because these are the most visible, but uh, there is also a rising literature now on all the forms of more informal living like industrial uh, 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 hamlets and so on and so forth, where you do have the organization by contractors of similar patterns of unfreedom uh, that might push, for instance, people to buy specific shops and so on and so forth. Now, when uh, we move this to uh, 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 looking at instead of international migration, 
uh, while there isn't very firm evidence, uh, for instance, in the Gulf, that uh, uh, workers are forced to actually then be allocated to a dorm, uh, so it's it's not in in the law. Uh, that it, it is also here a, a, a rising aspect of the actual uh, story of migration. So again, here the issue becomes uh, how. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. How um, that's more comfortable. How we think about uh, uh, organizing in this context, uh, and particularly how is it that we can uh, then uh, uh, focus on these living spaces uh, as spaces where new forms of organizing can, can take place. Um, we, uh, I get to uh, the the outreach uh, uh, story that is uh, narrated uh, uh, by Neha, and here for me the most uh, uh, sort of uh, striking. Uh, of all the lessons was uh, the evidence we have on the limitations uh, of uh, the um, pre-migration training uh, in whichever forms, which I think is really a very important lesson to take away. And with relation in, in relation to this again, as you know, ultimately an organizer, I cannot help but wondering how is it that we can sort of reappropriate uh, these spaces um, in terms of uh, again actions that would see uh, a, a sort of uh, networks, uh, uh, networking of, of unions across different sites. Again, if I make reference to garment experience, uh, I think, uh, again, uh, if starting from Bengaluru, there's been uh, experience by GATU in trying to sort of reach out <coughs> migrants uh, uh, directly in, uh, um, uh, from, uh, from place of origins. And uh, I do wonder what are the possibilities uh, in international contexts uh, to propose uh, something of the like, although, of course, I hear uh, uh, Igor's comments related to uh, the difficulty of uh, 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 working in contexts where you do have unions, but they look very differently from what we sort of uh, uh, might consider uh, uh, instead free unions in other contexts. Now, I, I, I think for me, uh, the, then there are like a few general lessons that, uh, or like few general points that I would like to conclude with, uh, which I think are particularly um, important points that uh, the uh, lessons learned have raised. The first is in relation to how the language of modern slavery doesn't really um, capture uh, what goes on in the actual uh, processes uh, of uh, migration for labor oftentimes. And I think for me, it's very important that the ILO has actually sort of uh, underlined this uh, uh, in the lessons learned from the program. Uh, and in many cases, uh, uh, the at least the garment workers that I work with are not enslaved, but they are in debt. And actually, the different ways in which the debt relations uh, are then uh, proliferating, uh, at least uh, uh, in uh, uh, this uh, labor intensive industry, places also uh, the wage relation as a key site increasingly uh, to uh, um, where these uh, uh, modes of indebtedness uh, are regenerated. And we have evidence uh, from the COVID uh, period uh, 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 and what reported by garment workers where wage theft is in fact one of the key issues that then escalates this indebtedness. Um, the um, uh, general issue then that I will raise, uh, sexual harassment emerged only tangentially, I would say, in the lesson learned. And I think this, uh, uh, to me, uh, also speaks to still the ways in which industrial relations frameworks uh, are not fully able to actually grasp with this issue as uh, it is uh, 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 utilized by employers as uh, a, a sort of uh, uh, mechanism for labor control. And so question for the future is, uh, how we can rethink uh, this uh, key aspect of the uh, uh, labor experience of the woman to be sort of play center stage uh, uh, um, in future work uh, so that we don't have to just address the issue separately, something that we have to do indeed uh, with reference to our work on industrial relations in India. I will just conclude with the last of Neha's point um, and I'll be re red carded very soon. Um, which I think is very important, how, um, how you tackle, and it seems to me that your last two lessons ultimately boils down to the way in which we tackle some of the worst uh, issues uh, for women when it comes to migration, 
actually start from uh, re-elaborating them really as labor issues. So if we want to tackle migration problem, we need really to start with labor, which I think it uh, could not to end with uh, uh, um, uh, on a panel like this. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Natalie is specializes in employment law at Durham University. Natalie. Thank you very much. And um, thanks so much for inviting me, uh, Prabha, Neha, Igor, and the ILO to share reflections on this exciting program. And I learned a lot from reading the lessons learned. So unlike Alessandra, I haven't been involved directly in the program. Um, and my, the, my research focuses on domestic workers, but not in these specific geographical areas. So kind of a, a step further back from it, but I'm gonna draw out some some key themes and how they relate to domestic workers, particularly in, in relation to destination areas. So I think first and foremost, it's excellent that the lessons center the importance of creating decent jobs as a as kind of the primary way to tackle trafficking and forced labor. And they really show how that goal requires the extension of labor law coverage to all workers, as opposed to the exemptions that we, we often see now for sectors like domestic work and or for migrant workers. So they clearly recognize how poverty wages, whether through exemptions from the minimum wage or because the minimum wage is set too low or for all these other reasons like debt and, and wage theft, um, you know, are, are really a structural factor increasing vulnerability to forced labour. And as, as Neha also mentioned, devaluation really comes into this. So the idea that it's that domestic work is not skilled and that it's just kind of similar to what women would do for free in the family home really contributes to it being so badly underpaid. I wanted to focus a bit on another area where domestic workers are frequently excluded from adequate labour protection. So that's the question of working time. Um, so for those particularly in live-in domestic work, there's often an expectation of a kind of unlimited number of hours to just work to meet the needs of the employer around the clock. Um, even sometimes persists after reforms are made to generally improve the rights of, you know, in the sector. And excessive working hours are pernicious, not just as a breach of labour rights, but also because they prevent workers having adequate time for their own family and private life. At the same time, the, the lessons also focus on part-time domestic workers who haven't been discussed as much, um, so including those working on an occasional or sporadic basis and the distinct challenges that they face in terms of their working conditions and, and opportunities for organising. Another point to think about here is that in many countries we're seeing a growing role of the gig economy, so you know, work completed on a task-by-task -task basis through digital intermediaries in the domestic work sector. And this can lead to uh, working time becoming fragmented. Uh, it can push workers to have to spend a lot of time marketing themselves, as well as kind of traveling between homes, none of which tend to be paid. So yeah, very important to sort of look at labor rights across the range of domestic work formats. Um, lessons also emphasize the critical need for collective bargaining and freedom of association. And they move that conversation forward by showing how those fundamental rights aren't necessarily addressed simply by migrant workers joining trade unions because unions may not always fully understand their issues, may not allow them full representational rights. So as, as has been mentioned, it's crucial for the different types of organizations, NGOs, trade unions, women's groups, to work collectively on the empowerment of migrant women workers. I'd also point to the specific challenges that domestic workers can face in organizing because of the isolated nature of their work and because of those kind of excessive hours. So it means that removing legal restrictions on collective bargaining is, is only one side of the equation. It's also necessary to ensure that workers have well, in the first place, information about unions, but also that there's a kind of floor of rights like adequate time off, which they can actually spend outside the employer's home to be able to exercise those rights in practice. Um, equally, there are important lessons learned on ensuring that labour standards are properly enforced. And I found it particularly promising in the lessons to see a clear call for the labour rights of domestic workers to prevail 
over employers' household privacy concerns. This has been one of the trickiest questions in the regulation of domestic work. For example, the ILO's Convention 189 on Domestic Workers' Rights refers to developing inspection measures with due regard for privacy and the special characteristics of domestic work. This is often assumed to mean that any kind of power of entry to a home for inspections is not appropriate, but actually it's right to question that assumption, bearing in mind that the, the human right to private and family life is not an absolute right, it's qualified right. And providing for inspections of homes that employ domestic workers relates to a legitimate aim of protecting those workers' rights and freedoms, because without that system, labour abuses frequently go undetected. Inspections also need to take place proactively, not just be in response to complaints, because it can be particularly difficult for migrant women workers to make those complaints. So the lessons learned on developing the capacity of the inspectorates in terms of both staff and finances are, are central there. I'd also say crucially inspection measures need to be separated from immigration enforcement because they otherwise risk becoming a danger rather than a help to migrant workers. So there are some related points on this in on the need for law enforcement personnel to respect migrant workers freedom of association and treat them through a non racist lens. There's also beyond that a need for legal protection so repealing kind of laws that criminalize irregular migration and work and putting in place firewalls that separate labour inspection and law enforcement from immigration enforcement bodies. Um, finally, kind of on the issue of migration regimes, the valuable points that have just been mentioned about, you know, legal migration channels don't automatically prevent abuse. So they highlight how sponsorship systems where a worker's visa is tied to a particular employer restrict mobility and increase employers power over domestic workers so they fuel susceptibility to trafficking and some of the measures to dismantle that haven't been enough if labor rights are lacking or enforcement is poor again something to add here is that you know other aspects of visa regimes need to be addressed to protect to properly protect workers rights and mobility so where um, routes are short term and don't allow for extensions, which is actually the position that we have here in the UK with a six month only visa for domestic workers. Then even if you're allowed to change employer in theory, it's very difficult to do that in practice. It's very difficult to take other steps to realise your rights, like becoming meaningfully involved in the union, bringing a tribunal claim, all those kind of issues. Another issue visa regimes often restrict or prevent domestic workers from bringing family members to join them. We might not think of that as directly a labor issue, but it, it does cut them off from their own caring needs and responsibilities. And it again does reflect the devaluation of their work because that is a right that's afforded in other, in other types of visa schemes. So yeah, um, overall, I would say these lessons contribute a lot to this kind of shift in attention in the movement against trafficking and forced labour. So putting uh, decent work, strong labour rights across all sectors, proper enforcement and genuine freedom of association at the heart of the agenda. And I think they rightly acknowledge that there are actually significant challenges in getting stakeholders to accept these more structural and systemic challenges rather than focusing only on exceptional cases. But at the same time, that is a very necessary shift if we are to effectively tackle the unacceptable impact of forced labour trafficking and other labour abuses against women migrant workers. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have had two very, very insightful presentations from Igor and Neha. Um, I would say lessons as well as findings from a very long tenure engagement with these subjects and opened up very admirably by Alessandra and Natalie. Um, though all our speakers have been extremely disciplined about time, thanks partly to Mike, um, we st are still running quite late. So there isn't a great deal of time for discussion, but I think we do deserve a little um, discussion on this. So maybe two questions from the floor. And if you will introduce yourself and say who you're asking the question to. We don't have any. Yes, Shalini. 
Um, thank you, Shalini, for this uh, question. I, I, I'm com I completely agree with you. This uh, looking at the life course perspectives of women themselves is very important because uh, often work is very closely connected, of course, with what happens at the home and not just uh, during the moment itself, but also during the different uh, um, trajectories of uh, migration or local employment or being at home. Uh, so yes, we have uh, at least uh, we have one publication which is outside that was done by a, an anthropologist, uh, Therese Blanchet, who basically studied the uh, uh, the pathways of uh, women, Bangladeshi women, going to Saudi Arabia, to uh, Oman, to Jordan, to Lebanon, and also in Bangladesh itself, uh, asking basically the the members of the family what they thought about the migration. Um, and women themselves of how they saw their migration uh, with uh, in, in retrospect after having uh, so th these these types of interviews happen through different mig several migration cycles often three four five migration cycles interviewing them um, after a few years and that type of work is it was only possible thanks to the fact that this program has been going on for so many years and um, I think it's very, very rich. So I basically encourage you to, I'd be happy to refer you to the studies of one physical copy of one of those uh, research or two of those that are outside. So I'll, I'll give them to you. Any, anyone else wanting to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. survivors of sex trafficking don't know that they are migrant women once they move from a source to a destination could you just uh, you know share some insight if at all if you came across it how then would um, a labor a labor rights regime or a migrants working organization help in this sort of a situation when women you know who are deceived in the promise of a job and promise of love marriage etc are moving from different parts of the country so could you just repeat the first part? Because I, I didn't quite clearly get it. Okay, I'm talking about survivors of sex trafficking. Uh, they also are moved from one place to the other in the country. So they're not migrants per se. I mean, they don't voluntarily give that or they don't have full knowledge of what they're stepping into. So in this sort of a situation, um, since we're talking about both forced labor and human trafficking, have you in your study found any uh, other lessons that would apply to this particular section or group or demographic? Yeah. No, thank you for that question. I think as a precursor, um, I think it's important to underline the fact that in most countries where we've worked, sex work is not recognized, right? So when we talk about sex trafficking, uh, it's, there's a complex picture which is, you know, which has to be drawn out here. Um, what we have actually observed and, and, and in my interaction with a lot of sex workers uh, also through this program, um, a lot of them reported doing domestic work before, you know, entering sex work or having to do both, right? And, and this is complex then because when we talk about survivors of sex trafficking, we don't talk survivors of domestic servitude, right? So I think it's, it's important that when we talk about survivors, um, are we then using a non-agential framework where we are taking away agency as a worker and putting them into the victim or the survivor category, right? So I think it's it's a really, I mean, I'd love to have a longer conversation with you on this, but I think it's really important to look at working standards and you know working conditions in, in general for women in the informal economy. And I think before we can talk about survivors of sex trafficking and the fact that they've been misled, let's talk about the range of, uh, you know, misleading information that is actually given by intermediaries, by employers, by even people who, you know, belong to areas of origin in actually channelizing some of these routes where women migrate into. So I think it's a much more complex uh, picture and I don't think we can simplistically talk about um, survivors of, uh, of sex trafficking in a context without talking about the larger world of work and the context where women really have very limited opportunities uh, to, you know, really access paid work in the labor market. Thank you. Thank you.
I think we should stop for this session. Uh, we'll be able to reprise many of these issues in the next session. Uh, just very briefly to address the debate on which we ended, uh, the binary of, I think, one of the interesting things that has emerged from this project is how false is the binary between migration and trafficking. And in fact, the many continuities that inform both uh, these relationships and the, the cat categories such as voluntary can be deeply deceptive, um, like the term consent in, in law. Um, so I think problematizing in, in, in a sense what has been so wonderfully productive about this project is that it has nuanced and problematized many of the categories which we are very used to dealing with in, in uh, uh, much more uh, um, less nuanced ways. So it's been a wonderful journey for me to say, uh, I'm very you know, pleased to have this opportunity to say and to thank Igor uh, and Neha and the speakers um, and to say what, what a wonderful opportunity it has been to be part of the project. And also to acknowledge that this project would not have been possible without ILO's infrastructure. Um, so to thank you, thank you to ILO, but also to appeal to ILO uh, that this wonderful, the, the momentum of this project uh, should not be entirely let go of. And hopefully there will be ways in which we can follow up, um, keep the findings of these uh, of the project in public view, uh, chase up some of its policy implications, um, and not sort of, you know, consider this to be an end, so to speak, but a new beginning. Thank you very much. We are on to the third panel for the afternoon. Great. So this panel will be on recruitment practices, uh, connecting up uh, countries of origin and destination. So we'll have Igor speak, and then uh, Natalie will respond, and then we'll hopefully have a few minutes for Q and A. So over to you, Igor. So just to give a little bit of an idea about the 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 context of uh, work on recruitment uh, and the sort of historical setting. International labor standards have really changed from uh, the beginning of last century with ILO's Unemployment Convention Number 2 that mandated a system of free and public employment agencies under the control of a central authority to ILO's Private Recruitment and Employment Convention of, 1980, of uh, 1997 uh, Convention 181, formalizing the role of private recruitment agencies, and finally, to a system of private recruitment agencies operating according to non-binding principles, general principles, and operational guidelines on fair recruitment uh, of 2016. Uh, so recruitment, as you can see from the uh, sort of policy uh, framework in international standard setting, has shifted uh, from public a public dominated sphere of responsibility dealt through employment policies and regulations to a private dominated sphere left to the market. But an important reason why public attention uh, persists around recruitment is due to concerns, of course, of vulnerable people, populations such as migrant women, uh, and such concerns tend to be increasingly influenced uh, by anti-trafficking nar narratives which frame the issue as a criminal justice rather than a labor matter. Uh, so that's a, so what are the, the, the conventional types of programs that exist around recruitment? They really uh, revolve around three different aspects, which is the promotion of fair recruitment practices um, uh, and fair recruitment policies um, that focus on undermining unscrupulous labor recruiters and exploitative employment practices. Um, uh, those types of policies usually involve uh, non-binding codes of conduct, uh, formalization of recruitment actors, and zero-cost recruitment for workers, among others. Then there's a sort of a, a training for um, recruitment agencies, and uh, which is very common. Uh, so, for instance, as part of the program, we were uh, 
um, gathering a lot of recruitment agencies and, you know, basically at the beginning training them about what are some of the uh, standards uh, on recruitment that are important to abide by. And, uh, and then the other one is basically assessing and certifying ethical recruitment practices, which is something which uh, uh, it, it's um, particularly done in the private sector um, through different forms of audits and uh, so forth in supply chains. So uh, what are the other practices that we, we did through the program, which is basically providing policy advice on uh, regulating recruitment into decent work? Uh, and dialogue on improvement recruitment practices, not just with the recruitment agencies who are registered, but also with the uh, intermediaries, the, the Dalals, of the, as often they're mentioned, or Sirdars, there's many names for them, but basically it's very important to understand what their perspectives are, even if, uh, um, if uh, they may sometimes be involved in good or bad practices. So uh, a third issue was basically doing not... Uh, an audit of a specific company about how their recruitment uh, practices are, but looking, doing pathway and sector-wide assessments of recruitment pa pathways, looking at base supply and demand and what are the um, different types of regulatory uh, mechanisms that in influence uh, a recruitment across countries or, uh, or within the, the country across states. And, and finally, the testing of better recruitment practices. So, just a few uh, lessons here uh, on the how the scale of supply and demand affects recruitment. Um, the scarcity of decent work options on a more significant scale may lead to more labor intermediation and poor recruitment outcomes. And basically, it means that ad hoc efforts to improve recruitment practices along specific corridors are far from sufficient as they fail to address both the demand uh, for and the scarcity of decent work at a significant scale. Um, this is very important because this sort of dynamic of supply and demand is usually not addressed in the usual types of uh, uh, programs and policies to try to promote uh, fair recruitment. It's too much of a macro uh, issue to address, but it's important to bring back into context. Uh, the second point, which is that um, while recruitment fees can be uh, exploitative, faulting the labor intermediary who charges the fee is really not sufficient. Recruitment fees are not only linked to the demand and supply of workers, um, uh, but also to the demand and supply for decent jobs by workers themselves. Addressing the scarce supply of decent jobs is more important fact. While workers do not like exploitative fees in practice, most migrant workers would prefer to buy the support of a trusted agent on whom they can apply social pressure to find less abusive um, employers, facilitate negotiation, uh, negotiate ex exiting difficult employment relationships, overcome the red tape of bureaucratic migration or work permit requirements, facilitate release of detention from detention, following the workers' employment uh, employers' failure to renew work permits, or navigate other policies restricting their mobility. So this is uh, uh, very important because in the discourse and the general um, um, uh, policy context of migration policies, it's often mentioned that it's important to reduce uh, recruitment fees. And of course, that is important, uh, but it's important to recognize why uh, uh, workers pay fees as well. Uh, and uh, if those reasons are related to being able to exiting abusive working conditions, then it's important to address that. Otherwise, uh, uh, the 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 root cause is not addressed and the problem persists. So the the third lesson here is basically about assessing and testing better recruitment practices and policies measures it tends to focus on the potential success of individual and specific boutique practices, and yet they seldom change the wider market dynamic that frames the context in which those recruitment practices are taking place. So for instance, uh, there have been many pilots of between different types of uh, um, initiatives which we were part of, but also uh, other um, organizations um, have uh, undertaken, uh, which look at trying to improve a particular recruitment practices in one company or in uh, one corridor. Uh, but uh, addressing supply and demand for work is is a very fluid issue. And, you know, it's not just through one particular practice uh, of addressing uh, 
one employer or a few employers that things are going to change because that often displaces uh, the competition uh, to basically focus on exactly what the those who are doing the better practices are actually doing. So it's important to have a holistic approach to recruitment. The next set of lessons is really about the segmentation of labor recruitment services, which is often not talked about because uh, uh, we usually see this as a binary issue of just recruitment agencies. But if we break down what basically recruit, who recruiters are and how uh, it's you basically there's a, a variety of other uh, uh, actors. So here, uh, next lesson is basically about uh, labor outsourcing and subcontracting policies have tended to blur the responsibilities of employers, labor intermediaries, and governments to ensure uh, fair recruitment and decent works. Uh, these policies have enabled, on the one hand, for private employers at different levels of the supply chains to delink themselves from the direct responsibility of recruiting and contracting. We saw this particularly uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic. It has also allowed for labor intermediaries to delink themselves from the working conditions that are offered to workers by employers or other intermediaries. And, um, and the setting of working conditions by default or design uh, in a bubble that is kept somewhat isolated from state regulation, um, uh, depending on, of course, the local legal context or market context. And this has been further complicated by the sidelining of public employment offices in favor of private employment and recruitment agencies, even though the functions of public recruitment uh, uh, office, uh, sorry, public employment offices are very different than those of recruitment agencies. Um, the next point is the efforts to ensure that labor recruiters share responsibility for labor recruitment outcomes should not concurrently offload the principal employer's responsibility to provide for decent work. And the fluidity and segmentation of labor supply chains is such that none of the key stakeholders, for example, workers, labor recruiters, regulators, and employers can guarantee a fair migration outcome for any worker on their own. So the... Uh, the next lesson is basically on the stigmatization of informal intermediaries. Um, the discourse uh, on unscrupulous middlemen tends to invariably stigmatize informal labor intermediaries. So the discourse can indirectly prevent workers from relying on informal labor um, uh, intermediaries or other fellow workers in accessing employment and seeking support to exit abusive labor and migration situations. It's often, in fact, uh, uh, these um, informal, for instance, in the Middle East, if you want to exit an abusive labor relationship, um, anybody who facilitates exiting that formal relationship can be seen uh, by law uh, to be a trafficker. And so it's, uh, uh, but if someone is trapped in a situation of basically forced labor, um, you need some sort of intermediation. And these intermediaries can play an important role. There has to be somehow uh, acknowledged. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the discourse in anti-trafficking uh, uh, policy circles often tends to basically invariably uh, um, uh, talk of um, these middlemen as being unscrupulous. And the, the profit motives of their work is, is usually mentioned to justify these trends. And while there are indeed abusive recruiters, not all recruiters are the same and profit motives are inherent to all market players and not just uh, labor recruiters. Um, the next point is basically on training programs on round recruitment. I mentioned that this is a common type of thing uh, that is done by many organizations like uh, ILO, IOM, UN Women, um, and many more. Uh, training programs on fair and ethical recruitment for private and public recruiters tend to assume that recruiters are in control and responsible for the recruitment outcomes of migrant workers they engage with. That's often not the case, especially uh, in sectors known to involve precarious working and living conditions. Undergoing such programs tends to falsely legitimize recruiters who participate in them and can often uh, enable them to be advertised in ways that mislead workers wishing to migrate. So there's a what we saw in, in the way we worked um, in uh, recruitment towards either domestic or garment work, there's often several layers of intermediaries or at the at the village level or the uh, um, in, at the slum level, or you have this at the 
national level and then you have in the destination country and then you have all these informal intermediaries some in the destination that help workers exit abusive re labor relations or manage different types of uh, issues releveling their work and so all that um, is important to take into account and and there you have also of course the recruit formal recruitment agencies and the informal ones uh, so then we have a series basically of lessons learned on the design of fair recruitment uh, programs and policies. Whenever prevailing working conditions are notoriously poor, promoting fair recruitment can be counterproductive in some contexts and can even amount to institutionalizing human trafficking. In sectors such as domestic work or garment work, where working conditions are generally rather poor, recruitment outcomes are necessarily messy. Uh, the promotion of fair recruitment runs the risk of institutionalizing recruitment into poor working conditions. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because uh, many NGOs try to, and organizations often uh, try to promote fair recruitment uh, in in good spirit, um, uh, even when it involves uh, you know domestic work or garment work, without realizing that if you cannot, if you, you don't know what the actual employment conditions are, then uh, promoting recruitment can basically be very, very dangerous for, for workers. So the, the last point, I'm right on time, is that the assumptions behind policies and programs seeking to improve really need to be reviewed. Um, and uh, here I'm just highlighting some of the uh, conventional practices versus some of the uh, characteristics of better practices. So for instance, uh, in terms of assessments of recruitment, that tend to focus usually on company focused uh, audits or assessment or formal actors only, assessments that focus on recruitment processes only. Um, it's better to have sort of like pathway sector wide assessments preceding uh, and determining company assessments, the involvement of both formal and informal actors in the assessments. Uh, uh, assessments include full uh, analysis that link decent work and uh, with recruitment. So these are some examples of of the types of uh, better practices that, that uh, are needed, not just in terms of practices, but also in terms of regulation. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into uh, the whole detail, uh, but I encourage you to, uh, to look at them. Um, so that's it, that's... Uh, Thank you, Igor. <laughs> Lots of counterintuitive lessons on the role of uh, intermediaries in, in labor markets. So I look forward to hearing what Natalie Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. That's fine. So if you want to make some brief comments, that's great. And or else we just open it up to, you know, uh, questions from the floor. Okay. That's great. Fine. Thanks. Yeah. Jens. Thanks. I'm Jens Lager from uh, SOAS, and I have worked on bonded labor and uh, labor recruiters in India for some years. Um, and I, I really, I, as just as in the last session, I will also start by congratulating Igor and the team for for the fantastic work they've done, because I, I really think you you hit the hit hit the head on the nail in the way you 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 emphasize the importance of uh, recruiters also for the well-being of workers while at the same time not overdoing the argument that there are limits where 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 recruiters can actually be uh, the uh, uh, part of what creates appalling conditions for workers similarly with regards to the uh, tight and slack labor market again i think maybe there one should also maybe be a bit more nuanced because there are cases where if labor market are tight or are, are slack it encourages employers wherever they can to be extra harsh because that's the only way they can lower wages because overall laborers go where go go to better places unless they're forced to work in certain places in my own work i've i've seen that 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 that, that under under extreme conditions under conditions of tight labor markets sometimes uh, for example brick kiln owners manage to impose extreme conditions because that's the only way they can keep laborers so 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 in general yes it, it, it is it is important to understand that conditions are harder when labor markets are slack but again 
there are nuances to, to that as well. Uh, I had one question, uh, which was the relationship between recruiters and unions. And maybe one shouldn't say unions, but uh, um, uh, labor organizations more broadly, because sadly, often they're not unions, but NGOs or, or, or smaller activist organizations. Um, there are, uh, as you rightly point out, a bit, uh, for workers very often, uh, it is the recruiter that is the only person they can go to, to, to demand better conditions because there's no one else now and that's important but if we're looking for further improvements of workers rights isn't this where potentially activist organizations come in and unions come in because it is a it is an odd situation that that the recruiter that benefits from the employment of the workers also is the only protector of the worker so sh would it be useful to think about the role of of recruiter within the wider context of actors you mentioned uh, state re regulation and employers but maybe it is also labor activists because really shouldn't it, it, it in, in an ideal situation workers would not have to rely on the re recruiter as their spokesperson even if that is probably very often the case right now thanks any other questions yes go ahead hi i'm yuki low from the freedom fund um thank you so much i i won't repeat what the gentleman already um, complimented the team on um wanted to just ask about two aspects that i didn't um think was mentioned although i haven't read the full report um one was in regards to monitoring and regulating recruiters in source countries what are some good examples um in terms of actual effective regulation because what we often see is that there is there is regulation on paper there is a registry of so-called regulated recruiters but often there is zero capacity of of the uh, you know, labor ministry to actually monitor them and what's the incentive anyway. Um, so I'm interested in seeing how, you know, there are models that you think should be scaled up to other countries. Um, second point is in regards to once the worker is in the destination country, as, as this gentleman mentioned, you know, often we do see the labor recruiters playing a role in helping them switch jobs. So again, what are you observing from your, your different experiences around the world in terms of how we can in some way, um, emphasize the role of that recruiter um, to respond because ultimately I think it's often a, a case what, what we find from the migrant work is a case of luck sometimes you're lucky and you end up with a great employer sometimes you end up with a terrible employer um, and so you know the recruiter does seem to have a role in helping them switch so how do we how do we promote that behavior any other questions yes Jennifer. Hi, very brief question on whether you see a distinction between recruiters who are only recruiters and recruiters who are also workers. So work, especially in factory contexts where you can have that domestic work may be a little less often. Thank you. you go. Um, so, so basically, just to start by saying it's important to emphasize that not all recruitment happens through uh, intermediaries. There's also um, experienced workers who already uh, know their employers and they migrate and they uh, choose. So that's important to highlight in domestic work, particularly uh, we've done several, a few surveys and where it came out that uh, recruitment through intermediaries uh, was, you know, basically uh, happening uh, only in a fraction of, of cases, a uh, significant fraction, but nevertheless uh, there. Uh, now, uh, uh, and of course, it, it, the types of intermediaries involved and whether intermediaries are involved really depends on the local context, the type of work, the regulation, the migration pathway. So it's a, it's a variety of issues that have to be taken into account. Now, uh, the issue about the recruiters and unions, I think it's important to highlight that, yes, absolutely, you know, unions, sh you know, should play an important role. I mean, in, there is a, we have been 
working uh, very closely with Sewa, for instance, and uh, Sewa has often been uh, in, um, particularly in, in Kerala, in, in um, Tiruvannantapuram, and also in uh, Delhi, in Bihar, they have been helping uh, collectives of workers negotiate entry into jobs. Uh, so in a certain way, you have an, a union that is facilitating the recruitment by basically uh, bringing, uh, bringing workers uh, together and going to see uh, the employers and saying, here we have uh, trained workers who are professional and could give you these types of services. So uh, it shows you that you know, a union can also be involved in mediating uh, uh, recruitment. And in such cases, it's important to recognize that you know, this can play this is this can benefit the workers. Uh, now, of course, this um, doesn't always uh, um, please some of the other some of the other unions who feel that this is basically uh, the unions playing the role of intermediaries. So it uh, uh, poses all sorts of challenges, and so um, some unions take a, an official line that this is not. Uh, I think this is not a position that should be uh, promoted. I think it's important to be practical and see what are the uh, emerging types of work and how negotiation happens uh, to be able to um, to basically uh, see where unions can play a role in a proactive way. Although, of course, understanding some of the limitations of what that can imply when they also become party to the entry into the employment process, particularly if the employer uh, is uh, can sometimes be abusive, and so what do you do in those cases? In those cases, of course, in the case of Sewa, they have a, a strong uh, a collective, and they can, uh, if there are problems, they can basically organize effectively uh, within. They know the neighborhoods, uh, and so this has been very uh, an important um, uh, finding. I don't know if it exactly answers uh, your question, uh, Jens, but uh, I think um, it's it's something that would merit much more uh, discussion. Um, Nikki, you were uh, you were, you were mentioning, you know, what are some good examples of what uh, can happen in terms of uh, in, in uh, areas of origin um, uh, on recruitment practice? Is that is that what you that was your question? Right. So <laughs> there is the. The, the area of recruitment, the country of recruitment um, or the state of recruitment is, is one area. So you have the capital region, but often the recruitment is in a sort of a uh, you know, local district type of a level. And there you have a sub-agent uh, that is involved. And uh, usually uh, the regulatory systems, they tend to somehow preclude the activities of or, uh, or ban the activities of uh, different types of agents, uh, and that's why they are they remain informal. So one good practice was to basically uh, have dialogue, engage in dialogue with informal intermediaries in villages, uh, um, and try to basically talk about what is a good recruitment process and what you know what is the role of a local recruiter, and trying to make sure that the the recruitment is positive and how. So when when the local recruiter is very closely connected with the local with the village, you often and they're recruiting from that very same village, then uh, you know social pressure can be applied in different contexts, um, and uh, uh, generally th there is a tendency also for recruiters to try to behave in certain way and apply certain good practices. A lot of the pr issues tended to happen when they were recruiting from outside the village or. And you, you have, you know, as, as I was saying, uh, uh, profit motives are inherent to all types of uh, business activities. And so it's not just limited to recruiters. But um, I think this general practice of, of trying to engage in dialogue at the local level with the, the local authorities, with the different types of women who work, who've been work, who've experienced migration, and uh, as well as recruiters, was an important uh, way of framing some sort of a understanding of what recruitment practices could be. Now, at the destination areas, in terms of switching jobs, it's a very uh, relevant question, and it links to what uh, uh, Samita was also mentioning. Uh, it's because many of the many of the intermediaries that are involved, particularly in the destination areas, uh, 
are people who are themselves have been workers. So there's a bit of a there is a bit of a uh, a tendency for for new workers to be basically, for instance, domestic work living going into living working relationships and the more experienced ones who have learned Arabic and who have you know know how to negotiate, they will tend to be able to negotiate on their own. And negotiating on their own means that they will also assist their compatriots who they meet uh, sometimes for a fee because they 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 also uh, sometimes have it. So uh, do you what do you call that person? Is that an intermediary? Is that a recruiter? Is that I mean depends on depending on the, it's a very um, uh, gray area. Um, but uh, nevertheless, this uh, this posed a, a lot of. Uh, uh, interesting challenges, um, and um, uh, some of these, for instance, uh, one thing I would like to to mention about uh, is how worker woman workers often talked about uh, in a study we did, um, and also through our work about this their own theorization of what uh, free visas are. Now, to be clear, there are no such things as free visa in the formal sense that uh, governments would sponsor. However, uh, in what the workers would uh, say is that we want to be able to be in a re in a working relationship in which um, we can switch jobs so that it, our, our employer allows us to go and seek you know do maybe some part time here some work uh, in some other type of a country and there are of course employers who allow that even though the law doesn't necessarily uh, permit that and so. Um, this is a, and so basically mediating and providing advice about how that works and how that is very crucial. It's a very important type of information that uh, would allow basically uh, women workers to know how to negotiate better. Um, and uh, uh, that's, these are some of the sort of uh, practical uh, lessons that come. And this has been documented in a, in a study that we will be publishing hopefully um, by the end of the month of May, just before we close the program. Um, and I'd be happy to refer you to. In uh, the last uh, point, I think the distinction, I, I think I answered the distinction of recruiters and workers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Igor. That was wonderful. Um, so we are moving straight on to the final session, which will be moderated by Mike. And here we are going to take the lessons of work and freedom and you know, kind of think about it in a larger perspective in the struggle against uh, forced labor, trafficking, and modern slavery. Uh, I'm going to go around in the list that we have on the agenda and ask you each uh, to comment initially on the implications of the lessons that we've heard about this afternoon, and then I'll come around again uh, 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 unless you feel it's not necessary to ask you about what's going on elsewhere uh, beyond the work in uh, freedom lessons. Um, I'm not going to talk about your biographies uh, or your eminence because it would all take time. Joanna, I'd like to start with you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, opportunity. Uh, thanks, Safara, Neha, and Igor. So, amongst the lessons, I'm going to focus on Lebanon language and decent labor. Um, I want to pick out uh, where we've been working to support the efforts to end domestic servitude uh, with partners in country in Lebanon. Um, the lessons note that there is a growing incapacity for employers to pay migrant workers agreed wages. Um, and also, we also heard earlier about how this type of work is associated with unpaid caregiving traditional subsistence roles. I just want to highlight that this lack of, yes, this lack of payment is heightened with the pandemic, the local currency collapse, but it's not new. Um, Sajita Lama returned to Nepal after being in Lebanon about 10 years and she was owed nine years wages. And she went through extensive negotiations and legal processes, which we supported her in to recover her wages. And of course, also the ILO, um, organized a working group on Kafala reform that was set up in 2019. And again, we supported a great outcome, which was this idea of a standard unified contract to govern relations between migrant domestic workers and their employers. 
which included things like a day off and annual leave and prompt payment. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm, uh, a fanfare around the announcement, but the effort came to a halt in October 2020 when following a pushback from recruitment agencies well, who together recruit about 90% of um, migrant domestic workers in Lebanon. So we talked about um, recruiters just now, and I think it's, uh, an important, uh, it's important for us to explore a little bit more. Yes, they are important in the business transaction, uh, and the point's well made, Igor made it earlier, that they shouldn't be routinely vilified. Um, and yes, of course, recruiters alone do not have the power to guarantee good working conditions. Um, they have a role, of course, in um, helping workers who are being exploited. And I just want to give an example of a survivor of trafficking to Saudi Arabia who rung up her recruiter and she said to me, just, she was telling me her story. And um, the, she said to the recruiter, I just, you know, I've had enough. I just want to change my job. You know, there's these dangerous wires that are hanging down that are live. And the recruiter said, oh, you just switch, switch off the power and get back to work. And then it dawned on her that her recruiter um, locally in her country of origin had absolutely no power influence at all, never mind the one locally who'd got her the position. So there, there is a challenge, I think, very much on this question of recruitment practices. And she herself said to me, I'd like to see my government actually handling the recruitment process. After all, they're the ones who I go to if I've got a problem. They're the ones who have to repatriate me and bring them back. And I thought, well, that's a bit fanciful. But then the other week, uh, I, um, the Ethiopian government has rolled out a recruitment of 500,000 domestic workers, largely domestic workers, to go to Saudi Arabia. This is a countrywide effort. They are promising transportation. Um, they're also saying they're guaranteeing wages. Um, of course, they cannot guarantee conditions, though, right? So they're perhaps doing the opposite of what the lessons are uh, showing us. They're emphasizing, in trying to protect citizens, they're emphasizing pre-employment interventions as a prevention strategy rather than focusing on, you know, how they can actually help support and secure uh, improvements in labor and working conditions in destinations. And, you know, of course, the, the concerns for Saudi for, for African migrant workers in, in Saudi Arabia is, is, is very evident. So I, I, I want to move on. I'm just going to very briefly say on Lebanon that, you know, the, the depth and the extent of intersectional discrimination against migrant domestic workers, criminalization and detention is a real issue. And in Lebanon, Shashila Rana and Roja Limbu, who we supported, they founded the Domestic Workers Union. It's the first union of its kind in the Middle East, but they were arrested and detained apparently for the work they're doing in, in campaigning for change. And just earlier this year, campaigner Samuel Tisve from Ethiopia was criminalized for calling for improvements in conditions. Let me switch though to another topic that came out of this program. It's very different, it's about language. We have talked a little bit about language, but I want to talk about the glossary that the Work and Freedom program published. It's a great critical breakdown of common terms. It notes the relative strengths and weaknesses, as well as respective ties to legal and academic and statistical definitions. Now, terminologies in this area is, it, it is co somewhat complex. It's fraught. We talk about modern slavery, human trafficking, forced labor, forced marriage, they're often contested. Um, and you may notice that in the program, in the lessons itself, it talks a lot about unfree labor and highlights the problematic of, of modern slavery. Um, can't explore it all right now, but I will say at Freedom United, we've published a navigable online version of the glossary, which you can see at freedomunited.org forward slash critical hyphen glossary. It's a useful starting point for understanding the meaning and implications of several key terms. I will say these terms are based on the English language and they, of course, therefore reflect the socio-cultural values and political dynamics in which English is dominant, such as international law. And based on our campaigning ex experience around the world, especially in the global south, it's important to remember that terms like human trafficking and modern slavery are easily translatable into other languages um, or approximate translations can take on quite different implications. So we took a, undertook a survey with our own community of translating modern slavery to help us better understand how these terms are discussed, framed and translated in languages besides English. And language is complex and we recognize local con 
cultural context and linguistic nuances shape advocacy and public understanding. But so the the existence of laws, they have the effect of making this language appear more real, but they shouldn't be the singular um, reference to how we think or accept definitions. Um, survivors and victims and those with lived experience um, have different views on how they identify with some of those terms. And we've heard about some of this has emerged through through the discussions we've had already today. Um, so I think yeah, language is an important part of, of, of this piece that we really do does does deserve the, the attention it has. Now, finally, um, on the programme calls on us to focus on proving conditions. And we know well how important organising is here. Migrant domestic workers are amongst the most vulnerable of workers. They're isolated in homes, they're reliant on employers for their legal status, discriminated as women, as migrants, as care workers, excluded from labour protection laws, low paid, low skilled, on and on I could go. Um, clearly regulations and laws must fix this and mitigate these vulnerabilities. And women must be empowered to claim their rights. And that is a strong theme in work in freedom, worker empowerment. The opportunities are scarce though. And without the lack of political space, um, even when workers are in a position to campaign, their time to campaign is rarely paid and to organize. I'll talk about this a bit later, uh, so, so I'll have the opportunity about why that's so important um, and why you know we've developed a campaign leaders fund to try and support um, people with lived experience to advocate for change. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Professor Obakata, can I ask you to go ahead, particularly with uh, reflections on the implications of the lessons we've heard about today? Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, uh, for uh, inviting me. And, I'm, and my sincere apologies for not being able to be there in person due to uh, uh, ongoing various commitments. And uh, uh, congratulations to the ILO and, and, and colleagues for, for this important work. Now, uh, in terms of implications, I mean, you know, that the lesson I, the message I got from that, the, you know, your work is that the picture is not as simple as, as we think in terms of actors and uh, exploitation, uh, recruitment, and so on. And so, so that basically means that we should not adapt a one-size-fits-all approaches as we need to take local context into consideration, uh, including the dynamics of various actors, how governments, for example, workers, trade unions, CSOs, and so on, interact uh, with each other to make this uh, uh, process work. Uh, and, and this, to me, underscores the need to include all stakeholders in, in developing and implementing a coherent uh, strategy. Um, and I do believe this is needed at both uh, at the countries of origin and, and, and destination. Uh, and I, I suppose it may be easier to do this and include, you know, have an inclusive decision making at, uh, and, and origin, but as more challenging is how we can facilitate that. Uh, destination like GCC countries. Now, I have visited Sri Lanka. That was my very first country uh, visit when I took over uh, uh, my role. And, and I've seen a, a number of the things that have been stated in this lessons are uh, quite you know, similar in what's happening in Sri Lanka. So I was like, you know, certainly kind of agreeing with, agreeing with many of the points raised uh, uh, in, in terms of exploitation, what happens in, in Sri Lanka before they migrate, and what happens in destination, who are going to help these people when they are exploited. So issues like access to justice, participatory decision making, and, and, and what happens after they are, uh, uh, you know, return or repatriated uh, into their own nations and some of these are highlighted particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic where, where, where the thing made things uh, much harder for, for, for you know, migrant workers uh, in destination they are made you know uh, homeless uh, uh, unemployed and the consular there's no consular assistance so, so that also raises a question as to uh, certainly uh, access to justice um, and, and so on but I do not want to repeat uh, what has been stated already uh, and like the role of trade unions and, uh, and workers organization for migrants are particularly important in my view um, as well as in terms of uh, uh, countries like G GCC region freedom to leave their employers and choose their own uh, uh, work and, and offering legally enforceable contracts uh, particularly important and, and because of many of these work are uh, in an informal sector 
And last, last year, I published my report to the General Assembly on the informal economy and the contemporary forms of slavery. And uh, while I'm not suggesting that all forms of informal work are exploited, uh, because of the certain conditions that are likely to uh, increase vulnerability among, particularly among migrant women. And domestic work is among the, you know, a, a good example of where that, that there's no regulation over uh, 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 you know, that, that particular type of work in, in many other countries. And because of the nature of work, you know, some, some people may live in, some people may live outside, they're longer working hours and, and not temporary and, and, and longer term. All of that makes it, you know, I found uh, from my own work difficult, for example, to un unionize uh, and organize and so on. So there's a, a kind of wider uh, uh, things that I kind of got from the uh, my own experience and, and comparing that with the, uh, the work that the ILO has done. So uh, I'll stop there and I'm very happy to expand on some of, of, of this point later if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Paratrick, can I move to you? Thank you very much. Um, I'm the UK's modern slavery envoy. Uh, so I come at this from a slightly different position perhaps from some of you who've been working on it for many years. Um, and I recognize by the way, the problems with the term modern slavery, but uh, that was chosen as a term that has resonance in the UK. Recognize that's not necessarily the case else, elsewhere. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that this is a program which set out, I think, to sort of push some of the boundaries of work in tackling uh, forced labor or non-free labor. And I think it succeeded. I think the quality of the results are a real tribute to the effort that's gone on into this over, over 10 years in the case of uh, the ILO colleagues and five or six years in terms of the FCDO colleagues have been supporting them. So I'd like to start by congratulating you on on the work. Uh, the lessons learned are very challenging uh, because I think that my summary, my takeaway is that there are no easy answers. Mm. And indeed that some of the answers, uh, the most effective answers are probably ones that require the most political will. And that is kind of, I think, uh, where governments come in because we can help create the international expectations and we can help in some cases leverage in particular countries to try and change the calculus in terms of the political will. I just wanted to say that the UK government remains committed to tackling uh, this issue internationally. Whatever you're reading in the newspapers in the UK, our international work uh, continues. Some of you will be aware that there are some particular pressures on the ODA budget uh, at the moment, uh, but that doesn't change the fact that this is and will remain a, a priority going forward. And indeed, uh, we will continue to have a partnership uh, with the ILO in this area. We have found a relatively modest amount of money to ensure that the lessons learned from the Working Freedom Program will be uh, circulated more widely. So that's good. And we will continue to spend relatively significant amounts of money in terms of program funding but i'm not suggesting that the program funding is the main thing that we can bring to the table uh, you will have seen that the issue of women and girls is is a priority for the current foreign secretary we we launched a strategy on uh, women and girls back in march uh, andrew mitchell referred to that in his speech this morning those of you who who caught that that is very much a, a priority modern slavery is very much a priority the broader human rights issues are a priority and we will work in partnership with uh, Alliance 8.7, the UN, the G7 to try and, as I say, shape that international environment. But the other thing uh, that I think is very important in our work is the debate around the economic levers which can change mm. the decision making of policy makers in, and, and employers, not just government policy makers. And this is where the debate is at within governments in the UK and, and internationally. It is um, something where we don't really have all the answers. I know the, the people in this room who will advocate for particular solutions, but I think it's fair to say that we don't have evidence yet in this area, decisive evidence of what works. Some of those measures around uh, import bans and around mandatory due diligence, uh, we need to think through what the implications of those are for other development objectives. I mean, there is a risk that in some of the most uh, 
uh, some of the least developed countries, those kind of measures will simply lead to companies excluding them from their supply chains. It just becomes too difficult to do the due diligence to, to, to bring them on board. So we have to, you know, I think it's important that we take time to understand what the, what the side effects of all of those measures are. But that is where the, the center of debate is and happy to talk further mm -hmm. about that at any time. Thank you very much. Um, Philippe, could I ask you to, uh, again, start by reflecting on the lessons of WIF? Sure. Uh, yes, can you reach it? Let's just check. Let's make sure it's on. Um, I don't know if you've said. No, it's not on yet. Let's just pass this one over. A lot has been said, but maybe three takeaway. Um, starting by what Andrew said, there is no easy solution. <laughs> but there is things, yes, that we know uh, from past experience. The, I think the first one um, is that the conventional approach uh, of coercion, for instance, of justice, of um, pointing the bad one, uh, has its own limitations. We know that. I think that's a very important element that the Work and Freedom Program has shown. The other element linked to that is that we have talked more about world of work instruments, conditions. We have talked about wages, working condition, recruitment processes, rather than forced labor per se. And I think that's a key takeaway. And it goes vice versa. And it's a call also for ODA. If when you work on decent work outcomes in general terms and improving working condition, you have a direct effect on the vulnerability of people to forced labor. And I think that's vice versa. And that's very important. And all the fundamental rights that I mentioned in my introduction, so elimination of child labor, forced labor, and discrimination, the capacity of people to bargain collectively and organize, we talked about the role of trade union being in the formal or informal economy in Sewa, for instance, the new working condition, I mean, the new health and safety condition also that now is recognized as a fifth category of right. They are all very much linked to each other. It means concretely that to have sustainable results on forced labor, uh, you need society where people can organize. <laughs> you need uh, people where less discrimination or structural discrimination exists. A and so in an agenda of working on equal opportunity for men and women, for instance, and avoiding discrimination also it's a means towards um, diminishing the prevalence on forced labor for some category. And I think that's very important. So it's not a shift in UK priority something. It's the way we think things. And I think we talked during three hours about the world of work and its reality and its complexity. I think a focus on that in the future, I think that's one of the key lessons um, that we can have. It's already very clearly uh, stated in different words uh, in the protocol uh, on forced labor adopted uh, in 2014 when we talk about the root cause, basically. That's one element. The second implication is, and it was mentioned when we talked about different wages for migrant than for the normal workers, is to acknowledge that all workers um, are not equal in the world of work. And that if we want to step up efforts to ensure equal opportunities and rights, uh, we should make sure that it applies to all without exception. And that should be the dream. 
Um, so the second implication is that right-based approach should be at the center of economic policies. You mentioned relation with trade and there is a lot of gray area. It's true. Um, in due diligence program, bans that affect some product and how does that implicate on social? I think one of the criteria is how to this economic policy or trade policy do have implication on people. <laughs> I think that's very important. Um, and it means concretely that regardless of country of origin, workers are first and foremost workers. They are not migrant workers. That's, I think, the, the second implication. Uh, the third one show that there is different categories. We talked about a lot of migrant and women in particular. Um, and it's true that forced labor, what the ILO is focusing on more than modern slavery, which has no legal definition per se, huh? uh, in a global estimate, we aggregate forced marriage and forced labor. The mandate of the ILO is to work on forced um, forced labor, which has a legal definition and statistical one. Uh, but forced labor, to talk only about that, has a face. And it's a face of a woman. And it's a face of a woman in the South. Um, and global estimate shows it very clearly. It's not true for all fundamental rights. On child labor, for instance, it's more young children. Um, boys than girls. Okay. Um, but women, yes, are more likely to than men to be victims of forced labor, um, in particular in some sector. Sexual exploitation was mentioned very clearly, and that's obvious, more than 80%. Um, in domestic work, in services, in general terms, the global estimate shows that very clearly. So when, Andrew, you mentioned that Indeed, or you refer to the uh, priority on education or on, on women empowerment, empowerment uh, on violence. I think we have a clear road of continuing partnership on those issues. If we want to continue on forced labor issue and working on the world of work, let's work on empowering women on the world of work instrument. And we cannot deal link and I want to finish with this um, on the implication to dealing the recognition of domestic work um, linked to the promotion of the ILO Convention 189. We were discussing during the break of to what extent uh, the level of ratification and, and in practical terms in countries those uh, ratified convention is implemented to the, uh, the relative forced labor nor we can de-link forced labor in particular for women with violence and harassment and the Convention 190 that is more and more ratified by countries. Those are hooks also that we can continue working and partner. And, and I can talk about in the second question um, of how we can partner differently in the future to continue um, taking stock of the so rich material that we have with such program into the broader agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Patricia, by all means address both questions because then we're going to go on to the wider issues, but over to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, they might be able to hear me. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak today on this really fascinating and very helpful study. Um, I've previously carried out qualitative studies um, looking at human trafficking from Vietnam, Albania, and Nigeria to the UK, and more recently a participatory study relating to young people with lived experience of human trafficking who arrive into the UK, their experiences, and how they consider their future and possible outcomes of their lives. Um, and I think the, one of the key points of resonance between this work and the work in freedom lessons relates to the way these issues are framed. Um, currently, to be trafficked can be a very stigmatizing experience. One of the first things we realized when we went to Vietnam, Albania and Nigeria 
across all three countries um, was that stigma was present in various different forms at various different times. Um, the label of being a victim or survivor of trafficking is a very emotive term. It conveys a complex set of judgments and values. And bearing that, bearing that label lives on. It has a life of its own, particularly if work overseas has been seen as somehow shameful. Um, for example, people returning to Albania, adults, I'm talking about here now, who had experiences of sexual exploitation were reportedly referred to, referred to as prostitutes. Those who worked with them were discriminated against um, as the people who work with prostitutes. Their children um, were treated differently to others in school, uh, needing to guard their addresses if they were living in shelters to be reintegrated. Stigma on return also relates to debt, not being repaid, or not returning with money and somehow being seen as having failed migration. Likewise, when people had been incarcerated or detained and returned with prison associations, there could be shame and stigma. Family rejection was a real issue for many returning. Others were mocked by neighbors and members of the community. Um, and because Niha spoke about what happens in the family, I'm just going to mention very briefly. Um, we also found shame and stigma could be part of the impetus to migrate in the first place, as well as being an outcome of trafficking. There were consistent accounts of people resisting the vulnerabilities they found in their own homes, the forms of violence or distress factors in the private realm of the home, some of which were stigmatizing and therefore hidden. These included victim blaming narratives around domestic abuse, physical and sexual abuse, early marriage, early divorce, pregnancy, out of marriage and infertility, you name it. Um, in our interviews, people spoke about having to get out or escape from these experiences, reminding us that families make decisions about migration. Families are also not always safe places. But then many went on to encounter structural and exploitative circumstances that sometimes rendered them vulnerable and or put them in situations of vulnerability that were equally bad or worse. Um, secondly, the concept and language of modern slavery didn't actually help us that much in, this, in these studies. In Vietnam and Albania, nobody knew what it meant. Um, they just referred back to the Palermo Protocol telling us about the act, means and purpose of trafficking. In Nigeria, well, it was a bit embarrassing, to be honest, um, and pivotal um, when we talked about modern slavery. The room went quiet. All eyes were on us as the UK researchers talking about slavery. Um, <laughs> the issues with this term are considerable, given our understanding, increasing understandings, actually, of colonialism, imperialism, the legacies of colonialism, how our modern world is so inherently bound up with histories of transatlantic slavery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we really need to consider the limitations of using this term in the research industry being built around it. Um, and just finally, the predominant criminal, criminal justice response tends to individualize the issues. But there are more structural issues um, that need greater focus placed on them. For example, in our study, we found the global approach to migration management practices was were the key structural reasons uh, people spoke about and were really heavily referred to in, throughout our interviews. If we consider the UK response, <laughs> dear, um, we, ha we have an immigration and asylum laws and policies that have created a natural environment in which exploitation can occur and thrive. As the asylum drawbridge is being raised higher and higher, more, it means more and more difficult and dangerous routes for people to take being the only way of reaching the country. And I think there are harms in this anti-trafficking space that really demand space for other approaches that are not based on rescue, detention, and deportation to unchanged circumstances. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, now I'd like to go around again for those that would like the opportunity and to ask you whether there's other uh, evidence uh, that we haven't listened to today that you think is particularly 
important, but also then go beyond that and uh, comment on what you think the need is to focus on globally in order to uh, end the patterns of abuse that we've been hearing about. Uh, Joanna, would you be happy to start us again on that? Yeah, let's start. Oh, it's that one back. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. I'm going. Uh, I'm going to be brief, but I want to. Uh, there's some really cool, great threads that have come out of the conversation so far. I think there's a way that we can move forward despite the evident complexity and wide-reaching um, um, nature of exploitation. And I think it's very clear from the lessons that the um, change has to be systemic and empowerment is key. So I think there seems to be a fair bit of consensus on, on that, which is brilliant to hear. Um, and also I love the idea of this concept of market coercion um, and how it forces job seekers to accept abusive jobs. So if current power dynamics lead to, current power dynamics lend impunity to violators, how do we shift power to put the focus on the worker to be able to have a future where they can stand up for themselves? That's what we ultimately are looking for. Um, systemic change that enables workers to stand up to ensure that, you know, we're not just waiting for the violation to happen and then calling on the authorities um, for help. And those public and political will to make those changes happen can be generated if we build support and through a broad base of the communities. Those who are affected and disenfranchised at the center, but with allies that rally around them and to build the kind of momentum that's necessary to achieve meaningful social change. Um, so I think for pushing the sector, the sector being all of us working to end um, the exploitation, to push us forward and push us our approach forward, we have to recognize the importance of this grassroots empowerment, this capacity and ability to campaign and advocate and secure a world that's more resilient to modern slavery. Effectively, I'm talking about is a movement that creates change. And that's, I think, what we need to be focusing on globally. We need to encourage meaningful participation. Um, I've, because of time, I've cut out all of what I want to say about the topic of you know, survivor engagement and inclusion, but it has to be meaningful. It's not an add-on, it has to be intrinsic in the way that we work. Um, we have to be inclusive in, in, in the way we work. We have to stop exploiting personal stories and conflating illegal migration with tackling trafficking. Um, as we've heard, something that we do, we're very familiar with in, in the UK. We need to stop taking a solely criminal response. That came out as well from the lessons. Um, we need to speak out about discrimination and racism. We need to include all workers in labor laws. Uh, we need to recognize the current power dynamics for workers. And we need to set regulations accordingly to mitigate those vulnerabilities. We need to resist playing to populism and demand fundamental labor rights, labor standards. I mean, that's what they're meant to be fundamental, the basic level, the minimum. So change has to be broad based. Um, it has to be empowering if it's going to be sustainable. And that's what we need. We need systems and regulations that support that social change. Thank you very much. I'm sure we could all clap to that, but we'll wait a bit longer. <laughs> um, Professor Obakata, would you like to come in again and, and comment about wider program impl implications? Well, I mean, I've already set up uh, uh, what I wanted to say, and I do agree with what has been stated. Uh, like, like, like she was just saying, uh, uh, you know the participatory approach to you know all of this include everyone in decision making um, and so on. But uh, from my point of view as a UN Special Rapporteur, certainly the uh, the promotion and implementation of international human rights and labour standards is, is extremely important, particularly in, in destination countries. And and uh, in my line of work, it's one of my tasks to to have a constructive dialogue with all member states to uh, incorporate and, and ratify and incorporate many of these uh, standards, particularly the international uh, trade, I mean, 
Con uh, convention on the rights of migrant workers and members of their families. I mean, that is, is one of the most like at least uh, ratified instrument there. And, and I think there is a need to promote that along with the international labor standards and, and the number of uh, uh, instruments, particularly something like a domestic uh, uh, workers convention and so on, it's, 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 it's there. But uh, 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 you know, countries do tend to ratify them just for the sake of doing it. Then. And so I think the challenge then is to uh, how do we usefully translate that in, in, into practice in, in, in many areas in domestic and other work. So uh, I will certainly continue to work with all stakeholders uh, uh, in, in that regard. Um, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew, would you like to add? I mean, just very briefly, I agree with a great deal of what's been said. I mean, clearly we have to have long-term programs. We have to have programs that are informed efforts rather than programs uh, that are informed by the people who have lived experience of this issue. I and mean, I'm talking, obviously you're talking about a different issue when you talk about worker participation, but also in how we design our approaches, those have to be informed by that. And that has to be non-tokenistic, which is why it's very difficult, particularly for national governments. Uh, once you get to the sort of senior levels of national government, it's very difficult to construct that. And it needs to be based on deep knowledge of the countries we're, we're trying to, to influence because this program has shown the complexities of each of those countries that it's worked in, and we can't affect change unless we understand the dynamics um, in each individual country. And the challenge to us is to discover the levers which allow us to produce all the things which which you've been advocating for. Mm. Yes, thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, you you definitely kept things back for your second opportunity. So let's give you the microphone and ask you to go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> First, an information. Um, as an organization, and because fundamental principles and rights at work are set in a declaration, we have our own institutional mechanism to assess progress made. Technical cooperation, by the way, is one tool which is clearly set in the declaration to support progress. But every five, six years, depending, in the ILO, the member states, government, workers, and employers discuss about those issues. I think it's an opportunity next June 2024, where the UK government, trade union, employers from all over the world can discuss how well we progress or what are the serious constraints in implementing legislation into practice regarding forced labor and any other fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. So that's just an information. But I think it's important because it doesn't come from a technician point of view. It's the institution and its member state who will drive the way of how we focus our efforts globally in the future. So it gives a North Star. Now, currently, and based on that discussion, uh, we will probably shape a new strategy. But for the moment, and it might not change that much, we have four drivers of what the ILO as an office is trying to push on fundamental rights, including and in particular on, on forced labor child labor. The first one, it's clearly, and I mentioned that, and many of you did mention that, it's the, the issue of governance of the world of work. Let's be clear, if there is no, if there is weak institution in the world of work, we won't have decent work outcomes. It's a bit simplistic, but it's a reality. On the same level of, um, not only governance is important, but based on the um, international convention, legislation that is put in place by countries are extremely important. Andrew, you mentioned the relationship between trade and, and fundamental rights um, and due diligence program. We know that for the last 20 years or so, in social, uh, no, a short or close of link to free trade agreement, the eight, now 10 core convention are mentioned. So it's important that the diplomacy of UK, 
can also be used to promote ratification and the implementation into their national legislation and into practice. I think that's something that we could push together because we're talking about core conventions here. So governance and legislation, both at international level and national level, are a core mandate of our strategy. The second level um, of our driver in terms of work is clearly, and it has been mentioned several times, in terms of empowerment of population and protection of those population at risk. We talk about women, we talk about migrant population, obviously, but there is many others uh, at risk. Uh, indigenous people, we didn't mention much, but there are, in particular in Latin America, in some other country in Africa, uh, in, yes, in Asia as well, very much at risk of forced labor. So working on the capacity of those population to be represented, to be empowered, to be recognized in national statistics in some cases. Uh, I had a discussion a couple of years ago with the social affairs ministry in Peru where I worked, where there was no recognition, they were invisible. And so because they are invisible, they are also much more at risk of any forms of discrimination and forced labor, among others. So empowering those groups and protecting through legislation and, and program is one of the key drivers of what, we, what we're doing. We mentioned, in, by the way, several times the role of trade union. Um, if we don't have a, a free, a democratic world of work with the capacity of organize as an enabling right for the other ones, it will be extremely complex to have sustainable uh, progress. So that's the second element of our work, environment and protection. The third one, it's more um, the approach, it's the advocacy and the alliance that are needed to make substantial progress. Um, you mentioned Alliance 8.7 that has been set up with many partners, ILO as a secretariat, it's not an ILO alliance. It's really made of different partners who push for the same agenda uh, on trafficking, on forced labor, uh, modern slavery, and on child labor, of course. Um, but there is many other platform of cooperation. And it comes with the clear understanding that w an, a single stakeholder be national, local, or international, will not achieve the results alone. And I'm talking, for instance, about the mobilization of the private sector. Uh, we have set up in the ILO two platforms, one on child labor, the child labor platform, which is head by O's, uh, ITUC and IOE, to exchange experience, knowledge, and have concrete intervention on some supply chain with the participation of multi uh, multinationals. The same apply for uh, the global business network on forced labor, where we mobilize uh, the expertise of the ILO to support efforts made by, by uh, the private sector. And I think that's something we can work on. The multinational uh, base in Great Britain <laughs> is also extremely important, and in the Commonwealth in particular. So that's another area where alliance and advocacy uh, are extremely important to work in some value chain uh, in particular or some, some country. And last but not least, and all the material that has been produced by Working Freedom, it's clearly one thing that the ILO in general terms and my, my branch in particular are doing or focusing is on research and data research by the program we implement, but much more importantly, research done uh, at the national level by the country, and also the data that needs to be generated at the country level to inform policies in the future. Uh, 
all talked about evidence-based policy, but evidence-based policy cannot be done if you don't know what you're talking about in terms of how many people, who are there, what are the practices, etc. And then I, the ILO has pushed for many years, at least on child labor and forced labor, um, to support um, statistical office, for instance, when we talk about quite quantitative research and data, to have introduced, it's not obvious, but to have introduced within their household survey question related to child labor and forced labor. It was not done in previous times. Mm -hmm. So this line of work can be pushed uh, also jointly in the future. I stop. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Patricia, would you like to come in again with any further comments? Until we okay. Get to <laughs> In that case, we've we've got certainly twenty minutes, uh, maybe a bit more, where we can open it up to the floor uh, for questions or comments. And once again, I'd like you to uh, say who you are, uh, and we'll see if we can get a microphone to you to ask That's your right, question. Right. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to turn to my colleague Prabha and just check whether any of our twenty plus uh, participants online have registered any questions and, and mention to you to them rather that this is this is the opportunity and I'm going to as as so often is the case abuse my role as chair and um, ask a question uh, which we'll come back to after uh, the qu other questions have been asked because uh, developing and influencing political will uh, has been extremely difficult uh, if I take some of the countries of destination that the project has worked on, Lebanon and uh, Jordan in particular, well, Jordan, we went backwards. We almost got to a point earlier this year where the Migrant Workers Center was gonna be closed. It's vital for the interests of uh, the migrant workers' rights in the text, in the garment sector. In, um, in, in Lebanon, as we heard, well, there were all sorts of question, uh, problems occurred when a domestic workers union was formed. Um, so the question then for us to come back to is, well, if we want to develop political will, how should we do it? Particularly political will to tackle macro policies. And I know the UK has substantial experience because it took this issue to the General Assembly in 2016 and asked states to, to sign on uh, to commit to ending modern slavery. And the problem is, yes, uh, as we've noticed today, it's not an issue of being an abolitionist or not. It's a question of are you going to actually modify policies that uh, make people vulnerable? Um, and so on. So that's that's the question I'm going to put, but I'm going to ask, first of all, for some other uh, others among you to raise your hands if you want to ask questions or make comments. Um, I know that one of our evaluators uh, had uh, an issue he wanted to ask about earlier. I don't know if that's still live, but could you give me a show of hands now to see who would like to come in, either with a comment or a question? I can see one. Any others? Okay, let's go to you, Michael. I'll, I'll let you explain what your role has been. Right. Thank you, Mike. Um, my name is, is Michael Drinkwater. I've been actually involved with, I've been uh, privileged enough to be involved with Work and Freedom more or less since the beginning. I was the team leader on two evaluability assessments for it, both the first and the second phases and also um, the team leader for the, the last uh, midterm evaluation that was conducted last year. Um, yeah, one, one of the, the comments I wanted to make or, or, or speak about, which actually was referred to at the end in some of the discussion between um, Andrew and Philippe was about the role of employers' organizations in, in this process. Um, I just recently done a, a piece of work um, with the IOE um, which is part of the tripartite partnership of, of um, the ILO, but actually tends to get um, downplayed or left out a bit. So there's been a lot of focus on recruitment agencies in this, in this work of WIF, but not on, em not on employers' organizations. And as part of the work that I was involved with was about employers' organizations, national employers' organizations, tackling 
illegal recruitment practices much more more seriously and, and looking to because a lot of the time is uh, they they simply wash their hands i mean it's it's it's, 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 it's been part of the, the traditional practice. So part of this work, which was funded by the, the Swiss Development Corporation with IOE, was to um, actually set up um, uh, um, national focal points in these national employers associations dealing with labor migration issues and to educate them on global conventions and then also to try to get them to play more leading roles with regard to bringing recruitment organizations into the fold of national employers organizations and, and trying to get them, you know, ba basic, basically try, trying to address recruitment practices that way. And I think certainly for me, this it's not necessarily an easy line, but, but I think an additional line of, of, of progress that could be made by, by more use of employment organizations as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as another vehicle to tackle this issue. And the second comment I wanted to make was also around the role of, of recruitment agencies itself. I mean, um, I, I think the way that, that, that work and freedom has really switched its approach from the, the first phase, at the beginning of the first phase, it was a more didactic program looking at um, fairly conventional um, uh, approaches towards training uh, of, for, 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 for uh, migrant, migrant workers. And then it switched to this um, the focus on empowerment and 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 the agency of of, of um, migrant workers and that, that and that and all these lessons come out of, out of that switch and that was a really really major major switch in in the in the work that's done. But um, I think Joanna mentioned at one point that the, the issues around the standard unified contract in Lebanon. For, for example, and the role that recruitment agencies, that the, the SUC has existed for, for a, a lengthy period of time. The Kafala Reform Working Group there was, was trying to, to, to bring it, include um, domestic work much more with, within it and, and to try to get um, more of a focus on, on, on labor, labor rights. And as Joanna said, that the recruitment agencies themselves were responsible for um, uh, for, for uh, bringing it to a, a court of appeal and, and getting it re rescinded. But um, in the last evaluation we did, I actually talked to the, the head of Sorrel as the, the, rec the recruitment organization, umbrella recruitment organization in, in Lebanon. And the interesting thing for me that came out of that discussion of how recruitment organizations were really did not want to engage with changes that are happening in, in, the, in, the, in the world of work. And in particular, for, for instance, as if you're looking to empower migrant workers, one of the things that you can do most is allow them to switch jobs more easily. And, and they like part-time work because it means they, they have a bit more choice in choosing their employers. The recruitment agencies themselves did not want to look at employment of migrant workers on, on a part-time basis to, to facilitate that move, which, and, and in that sense, they were not meeting the demand of employers either, because given the economic situation in Lebanon, as well as in other countries and countries of origin too, workers don't want full-time live-in domestic workers any longer, unless they're very wealthy. Most of them, the increasing demand is for part-time workers, but there's absolutely, but the recruitment agents, which are getting their fees from the recruitment of full-time workers, they, they still weren't, weren't interested to, to consider it. So for me, the, these provide opportunities for working at, at, at the employer side, both working with employers organizations and trying to work, if, if you're gonna work on empowerment of migrant workers, you want to work on facilitating more opportunities to switch jobs and to engage in part-time work. I think there's potential in both those areas. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Any other question, uh, questions or comments from the floor today? Jens at the back and then one other, yeah. Thank you. So it was, uh, of course, very rightly pointed out that um, the face of of um, upon the labor uh, is the face of a woman. One could also say it's the face of someone from a different ethnicity or race uh, or, uh, than the employer. I mean, that is well known as well. That, that, that is the case. And, and it's documented well. And I've been 
lucky enough to be part of documenting it as part of the, the reports produced by by this program. Um, I wonder if the panel and, and maybe in particular Philip could could uh, could comment on that because I, I I heard little on the uh, on on the importance of that in dealing with. Um, uh, bonded labor relations and, and of course it is the fact that the UN talks about the reparations that um, uh, Patricia pointed out that it was quite difficult to go in in, in West Africa and, and and mention anything about slavery so it is a discourse that also Black Lives Matter that actually is quite strong out there and of course it is also part of the anti-discrimination uh, uh, work of, of the ILO in principle so it, be interesting to hear uh, what is the profile of that uh, that you see in the work against bonded labor okay thanks very much then for our last comment can we go up, up here to the far corner thank you uh i realized that there was a question asked towards uh, for the panel towards the end but i just had a question kind of related to that um i was wondering when negotiating with countries on a well, national policy level, uh, I was wondering to what extent and which reasons countries cite when they're not really uh, cooperating to ILO guidelines or the international agenda uh, in terms of implicating Im enforcing policies um, related to uh, migrant worker conditions and uh, human trafficking. Um, so yeah, just what the geopolitical implications of uh, regulating, I don't want to say too hard, but taking an assertive stance at least against um, bad conditions for migrant workers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one last comment is going to uh, come uh, online. So please, uh, let's see if we can hear you. Now over to you at last. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to comment on just, the... Just introduce uh, yourself, Therese, for, for I'm bronze quite a bit. Moshe. I'm an anthropologist, and I've been working uh, from Bangladesh um, on Bangladesh migrant workers in, in Bangladesh itself and in uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Oman, uh, and also some work in on Saudi Arabia. Um, so uh, I was in, um, in Jordan, Lebanon, uh, just a year ago, and I wanted to comment on the... Um, Mr. Michael Drinkwater talked about uh, uh, recruiting agencies not being interested in uh, in um, uh, this uh, this idea that uh, uh, migrant worker want to have uh, part time work, uh, not living with their uh, uh, with the employer, and have the freedom to um, uh, rent their services to different people. You know, they are paid on an hourly rate and the women living out, um, many of them undocumented, but they could be documented with the so-called free visa. Uh, they, they earn more than the women who are, um, who are living servants. Of course, there are ups and downs. During the COVID crisis, they were in a very bad situation. When I was in uh, Jordan doing the investigation uh, last April 2022, uh, I heard for the first time of women who had no work. I mean, women who went to an agency, all that is unofficial. And they, 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 they sat for the day, the agency took 25% of their pay. Uh, and so, I mean, something has begun to happen unofficially. Recruiting agencies are in a crisis. They, they are not getting uh, clients as they used to be, as they used to have. And um, I mean, in countries like Lebanon in, in Lebanon and Jordan, there are uh, many women who are there. There are networks being organized. Women have their um, list of phone numbers. Uh, they keep in touch with clients and they do that by themselves. And so some of these women are undocumented. Others came with the so-called free visa and free visa are very easy to get for domestic workers. Uh, one woman explained that she uh, uh, had uh, uh, for the nationals, it's a rent of uh, a yearly rent. And she had contact with her kafil uh, two or three times a year. And uh, they, they, uh, they trusted each other. And she went on to organize her work 
I mean, I call these women and that, I mean, the best of the better, the best of them, they are entrepreneur. And as I say, there are ups and downs in their work during the COVID period, they were, uh, it was a very difficult time for them, but things are changing without being officialized. And there is a, um, a rigidity to the system. I mean, I, I, I work with migrant workers, so I, I, I don't work so much with government people. But um, I found that uh, the, the, I'm not surprised that recruiting agencies have less work because for the employers, once they have a list of potential uh, uh, women who can come and clean their house, it, it's much easier uh, for them. They don't have to pay fees to the government and they don't have to pay fees to the agencies. So thank you very much. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. As usual, the, the workers themselves can find better solutions than anyone in a power above them. Um, let's just see whether uh, some of the panelists would like to either respond to questions we've raised or make further comments. And then I'm going to give uh, the word to Igor right at the end to see if there's anything here that he would like to pick up on. Uh, so uh, let's go around in the same direction. You, you, you're under no obligation at this point to say anything more, but Joanna, anything for you first? I'd like to pick up the, the first question, actually. Um, which was around how we generate political will. Now, um, I would absolutely, in this case, look to social movement theory. Um, that shows us that change follows power shifts and that those power shifts can um, happen through mass action. And why is that important? Well, next month I'm at the Global Freedom Forum and the forum itself acknowledges that, and this is a forum for anti-slavery, um, leaders. The forum itself acknowledges that currently modern slavery is not recognised as an issue of universal concern. So it's not just me saying that. This is the fact. The idea of exploitation is there's there's not a a wide held belief that there's a problem around this. So what we need is a strong united way forward to catalyse acknowledgement of the scale of this problem which is massive i mean over 50 million at any one time probably a lot more at local regional and global levels and that in itself would surely generate the public and political will necessary to successfully secure the kind of changes we want to see thank you um professor obakata are you still with us yes i am i have nothing further to uh, except to say that there's a, as an independent expert uh, for, uh, under the Human Rights Council, my job is to promote a constructive dialogue with all stakeholders. So you know, I will continue my uh, work uh, uh, with particularly the governments in the destination countries to uh, you know, enhance the, the workers' rights uh, and other important human rights uh, norms and, and standards. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll depend on you, I think. Uh, Andrew, do you want to add anything? challenge I posed to myself so I don't yeah. really have an answer your first question but I mean I'm I'm wondering in due course whether the Malaysian glove industry may it's not perfect mm -hmm. not suggesting it is but clearly there has been a change there and what were the factors that helped bring that about mm -hmm. and is that a model that can work elsewhere mm -hmm. we should research more on that um, thank you. Okay, maybe two reflection I don't have an answer complex on the political will and on the role of employers and profile and on the political will i mean there is a few elements that show that a combination of elements may trigger a political will the problem we have the tendency to generalize and that's um you mentioned uh, an example from your the country. Malaysian the Malaysian, Malaysian yes. I'm not, I'm, but I'm deliberately making the point that it doesn't necessarily exactly. convert to other countries. We are currently working, and I don't mention on purpose the country nor the sector, on a shift of political will based on a ban that was established. And suddenly, <laughs> I don't want to make the connection, but suddenly there was a political will in trying to call the expertise of the ILO and to engage on a tripartite basis on dealing with the issue of forced labor in the 
children in sexual significant children country but bans or any other forms is not the solution I th at least we don't have the evidence that is the solution in some cases it may be a trigger in other cases it may worse the situation at least we have initial evidence on that so there is clearly induced kind of incentive depending on what there is global pressure the social movement for instance but also the recognition that the world is evolving business are evolving and so we have to trust also that we are going in the right direction and stakeholders truly and that's also what social dialogue is all about the trust in the other party although interests are different and i think um the political will what it, whatever it's not really important where it comes from or how to make sure um if it's you create the condition to trust the employers to trust the worker to trust the government that it's in their own interest to change this political will will come with other elements that may help i think that's one element so it's not an answer straightforward answer but it gives you elements i think on the way forward um on the on the employers and the, the if i understood correctly um we might if i understood correctly uh, uh, we might enter into this uh conventional way of seeing uh the good cop and the bad cops <laughs> um there is clearly in the labor market employers in scrupulous who abuse workers both informal and informal economy that's very clear um but what's probably more important is and as we discuss to make sure that we have the institution in place the system in place to deal with decent work outcomes in general terms um if we don't have that we won't have the labor relation established to diminish the risk on forced labor so there is not one profile of employer like there is a profile of a workers um i mentioned it to simplify a bit uh, the, my pro pro pro. Uh, i think we should not be trapped into this conventional way of seeing the good employers the good workers the uh, re good in recruitment agency or the bad one but rather where are the incentive in the labor market and institution to advance towards progress on these rural outcomes including on the fundamental rights um, if we trust in that process we create the condition for bringing employers and workers who wants to advance this, uh, this agenda forward more than looking at or pointing on who are the good ones and the bad ones? Thank you. Is there anything further? I can say a few things about the role of research in um, some of these answers. Um, just to say that when we were in Vietnam, Albania, and Nigeria, it was really striking how very little evidence we had from uh, those particular from, re from researchers within those particular countries. And I often wondered how we. Um, we might need to consider how we help to create space to grow that i don't know whether it would be indigenous evidence base or indigenous evidence base um and you know if we had that we might have some strong counter narratives that we could work with um and how we go about doing that to sort of uh, bring understand the experiences of different people in different countries in different places um into involved in a more sort of thicker and nuanced way um, I think we do need um, more nuance to this debate. It's very polemic at the moment. Um, and I think when doing research, the, you know, the voice or, or the voices of people need to be in, incorporated. And 
um, we do need more contextual understandings, very deep historical understandings, um, thinking about the ways that, that history and context shapes migration. And I really liked the ILO um, link between the source and destination because we don't tend to think transnationally in that way all the time. We sort of frame it very nationally. Um, and, but also I think what happens en route is, is a really important thing. When we looked at Vietnam, um, young, young and middle-aged men were coming via Russia, um, walking into Eastern Europe, coming to Western Europe, um, and, you know, there were all these points of extreme vulnerability en route as well. So I think source and destination and the bit in the middle is definitely something we could focus on, but definitely grow the indigenous evidence base within different countries. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the, the panel discussion as much as I. So thank you very much, panelists. I'd like to turn to Igor and uh, uh, invite him to come over to, to the microphone here so you can you can be heard. Uh, no, it's okay, no, please stay, stay there. And he may want to comment on what you've said. So uh, come and take, take the seat where I'm sitting. Don't take more than a few minutes, Igor, because we're already uh, running over, but it's really just, is there anything else to say to wrap up uh, how we go forward? So just uh, two comments and uh, a note of gratitude to everyone. Uh, the comments were basically on the uh, on this whole, you know, how to address policy uh, challenges that are structural in nature. I think this is something which uh, has been uh, one of the most important uh, uh, nagging questions that we have been experiencing throughout the program everywhere, and uh, it's been really. Uh, um, a collaborative effort trying to document all this. Uh, I think it's it's it only works when you have, as we have mentioned, uh, really a broad uh, coalition of support, uh, which goes across different types of stakeholders. You know, uh, Joanna was mentioning how the theory of social change uh, is important to take into account. To give a specific example, in Nepal, we were we've been trying to advocate for the to the removal of a ban on women migrating for domestic work. And there's been uh, different um, uh, back and forth happening. Uh, and it has been really uh, very much influenced by the capacity of civil society organizations, uh, which involved a variety of different women organizations, migrant right organizations, uh, unions, as well as, you know, different uh, government actors, including the uh, Commission for uh, for Human Rights uh, to get together and highlight, including parliament parliamentarians, to highlight that these types of bans don't work. And so, uh, and then you have basically some degree of realization that's important. But then you all of a sudden you have a, a particular case that is mediatized where you have extreme abuse. Somebody ha you know um, uh, abused in Kuwait or uh, in another country, and then uh, then the pressure mounts up to do something and then you have uh, government uh, officials thinking that we have to show that we're doing something and therefore we put back the ban as some so th and this type of shifts tend to happen it's but it's very important to have uh, these uh, uh, coordinated um, efforts in terms of uh, framing advocacy so that's one point uh, the point on uh, employment i think uh, organizations uh, very important to also highlight that in the case of uh, domestic work, for instance, it's very hard to find organized employer organizations. So when we talk to employers, it's often you do have, uh, like in the case of in India, you have these residential um, organizations and compounds uh, which uh, do, uh, with which we, with, we, we can sometimes talk to. But it's uh, it's very important. To, it's not a structured um, organization in the way that, say, the uh, IOE would be, uh, the International Organization of, and and, um, and therefore there's still quite a lot of working progress to achieve on uh, on on that end. But definitely in our work, we have had. It's been very important to work with employers. 
uh, particularly in Jordan, uh, one of our strongest allies in the, in the garment sector has been often the employer organization uh, there, uh, J-Gate in particular, that has been, uh, that played an important role in basically highlighting uh, and, 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 and basically some of the grievances that are, we're, we're referring them through the worker center that were, were there. So those are a few just points, but uh, I, most of all, I wanted to just uh, say that, um, express my uh, gratitude to my team, uh, partic- who is not only, uh, not just here with Neha, but also uh, who are, have been participating online. Uh, and involve uh, also basically, uh, we have uh, Narendra, who is our monitoring evaluation specialist in, in, um, in Nepal. We have uh, Anne Drong, who is our national program officer, uh, coordinator in uh, Bangladesh. We have Zaina Mezher, who is our national coordinator in, uh, uh, in Lebanon. We have Suha Labadi, who is our national program coordinator in, in uh, particularly in, in, in uh, Jordan. And Sunita Eluri, who is basically the manager of our worker center in uh, in um, uh, in Jordan, and of course we have all the support staff that have been with us. So, uh, and I also am very uh, grateful for the support of our uh, different offices across the region, the directors and the uh, specialists who have been there. They really have uh, allowed us to basically catalyze all the immense amount of knowledge that IO has accumulated over the years to leverage. Uh, the type of work that we're doing. And finally, uh, uh, also to uh, thank um, Prabha and Mike and Samita and Ibrahim Awad, who have been uh, with us. And of course, uh, FCDO, uh, Andrew, Ben, Mike, uh, and the rest of the team. So thank you very much to all of you. And of course, to the uh, speakers who are with us today, uh, who have taken the opportunity. I think it's been really enriching. I would uh, we have, I think, uh, uh, recorded this, and so I, I hope that we're able to put this online for for greater consumption outward. So thank you very much. Thank you.